Good morning and welcome to the 21st Annual First Amendment Congress. My name is Andy Moore. I'm the Executive Director of Freedom of Information Oklahoma. We're so excited to be here with you today and offer this First Amendment Congress in a new virtual format. I know that we all wish that we were together, um, but perhaps there is a silver lining that by doing this as a live stream, it allows us to actually reach more people and participate that might otherwise be possible. You know, we strongly believe that more Americans need to understand how integral the First Amendment is to our everyday lives. The First Amendment enumerates five freedoms that most of us take for granted. The freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, and the right to petition our government. I mean, that ain't nothing, folks. This is a big deal. So on behalf of Freedom of Information Oklahoma, we are honored that each fall, hundreds of high school students and teachers from across Oklahoma come together for this event, the First Amendment Congress. This is a one day conference focused on the First Amendment and how it relates to our lives. Since the annual program began in 1999, more than 3,000 Oklahoma high school students have attended the First Amendment Congress and after today, we'll be pushing that number closer to 4,000. We have three very exciting presentations for you today. The First Amendment Rights of High School Students with Dr. Joey Sinnott in just a few minutes, which is a perennial favorite, followed by an inside look at a national organization that is working right here in Oklahoma called Generation Citizen. We'll see how they are using action civics to help middle school and high school students make real change in their communities. And then we'll end with a Know Your Voting Rights, which is very important and also super timely as uh, we just are on the heels of one of the most important and discussed elections uh, in our country's history, at least in the last 50 years. And in many ways, it's still going on. So one quick note before we get rolling with today's program, throughout the day, if you have any questions for our speakers or want to respond to questions they ask, for example, uh, Dr. Sinnott will uh, is always interested to hear what questions 
high school students have about their First Amendment rights and how their rights are affected while they're in school, right? So uh, we strongly recommend that and encourage you to post those questions in the chat box. Whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, you can comment there and we can see it here on our end and we will try to answer them uh, as we get as we get through it. Okay, on that note, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to my friend and colleague, Dr. Joey Sinnott. Our descendant's going to speak to us about free expression and the other First Amendment rights of high school students, which is something that all of you should 100% care about. Good morning, Dr. Sinnott. Good morning. I'll let you take it away. Thank you. I appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad that you're able to join us this uh, morning. Uh, the weather's better. That's good. Uh, and, I, and I really appreciate that students and uh, their teachers and whatever administrators allowing you to do this because this is really important stuff. This is how you participate in your government, um, how, you, how you let government and everyone else know what you think and, and uh, how things get solved in our society. So I'd like to, and again, as we go through this, if you've got questions, put them in the comments about something specifically I'm talking about. And I'll also leave time uh, at the end, sort of want to find out what's going on at your schools that maybe you're concerned about what you've been told you can't say or wear or do. Uh, and we'll go through some of those. But the first thing I want you to think about is what do you think the, the greatest threat is to the First Amendment? I mean, What's threatening it? Um, government censorship is clearly uh, something that that uh, is a problem, but the really the their greatest threat. And I'll give you a hint. Uh, there's a survey that shows only one tenth of one percent of Americans can name all five First Amendment freedoms. Only one tenth of one percent. That's not good. Uh, usually they can name speech and press and religion. Some people throw in um, the right to bear arms, which is not in the First Amendment. That's the Second Amendment. Or they might throw in the right to be free from unreasonable search and seizure. That's the Fourth Amendment. So the question is, if they don't know what their rights are, what's the greatest threat? It's our ignorance of what the First Amendment is. If it's hard to flex your rights, the, the, the title for this uh, presentation today is flex your rights. Well, you can't flex your rights if you don't know what your rights are. And if you're ignorant of those rights, it's really easy for people to take them away from you. And across the country, this happens all the time with high school students. They, they don't have a clue what their rights are. And so administrators, are saying, no, you can't say this, you can't wear that political message or religious symbol to school, and those students are having their rights violated. Now, normally, if we did this in person, <clears throat> I usually begin by walking around and demanding that students give me whatever money they have in their pocket. And sometimes they're really shy about it, and I get kind of gruff. I, I mean, demand that they give it to me. And they'll hand it over. They'll give me their money. And then I make a point that, why did you do that? Why did you just hand a stranger what money you had in your pocket? And it's because I've got a microphone. And I'm an old white guy wearing a white work shirt and a tie. Yeah, that's, that's intimidating to students. That's authority. That's your administration. And so students often get intimidated out of their rights uh, without knowing what they are. And then you've got somebody telling you you can't do something and you're taught to be respectful to authority, then you're gonna hand over your rights. So we're gonna try to give you some education about what those rights are. And I want you to always be respectful when you are challenging authority, because if you're not, then your behavior in that instance or your the way you speak back <clears throat> becomes the issue instead of what government's doing to you, what rights they're taking away from you. So I urge students always to be respectful simply because um, you look better in that situation and people are much more um, uh, 
uh, sympathetic to your cause, okay? So let's talk about even if students, even if the public can name all five rights, they don't necessarily then know what they mean. For example, you hear people say when they're trying to censor speech that they don't want to hear, they'll say, well, the First Amendment's not absolute. Okay, well, that's true. The, the First Amendment's not absolute. What would it mean if the First Amendment was absolute? Well, that would mean that government could never censor you or could never punish your speech. And that's not correct. Uh, we've got libel law. And by the way, don't forget, if, if you don't know, your state constitution offers you freedoms of speech and press. And our state Supreme Court has said those rights under the way our, our state constitution is phrased provide you even more rights of freedom of sp uh, speech and press. But even that provision says you are responsible for abusing that right. And it talks about libel. So libel law exists. It's a way to punish people when they say things that are false and defamatory, things that are false and hurt someone's reputation. There are other parts of uh, kinds of speech that are unprotected by the First Amendment. For example, obscenities. And we won't get into the complicated First Amendment test, uh, the Miller test, to understand whether someone something is either obscene and unprotected or whether it's indecent. And adults, uh, consenting adults, have a right to uh, have indecent speech. Obscenity, though, is unprotected. How do you tell the difference? It's really complicated. Oh, and by the way, obscenity does not mean profanity. Uh, Four-letter words are not obscene, okay? And in some cases, profanity might be protected. In some cases, uh, in certain circumstances, it might not be, particularly in a school environment, okay? So they'll say, well, the First Amendment's not absolute, as though that means government can regulate all speech simply because some small categories are not protected. And that's not true. Government cannot regulate all speech simply because some small categories, well-defined, long-defined categories are unprotected. So the next thing they might say is, well, you can't cry fire in a crowded theater, okay? Unfortunately, uh, when they say that, they don't realize that that test was replaced by the U.S. Supreme Court, the clear and present danger test, was replaced by the U.S. Supreme Court more than 50 years ago. So that's not the current test. So it shows a certain amount of ignorance about First Amendment law when someone throws that out. By the way, the current test, and this is an example of very narrow category of speech that's not protected, it's under the Brandenburg test. And the test says, all right, the First Amendment protects speech that advocates an abstract idea, even the use of force or illegal conduct in the abstract. What it doesn't protect is speech directed to inciting or producing imminent illegal action, and the speech is likely to produce that action. So even if you're advocating for violence in an abstract way, an abstract idea, it would still be protected. Uh, that's important when you are uh, trying to advocate sometimes for change in government, change in the way it operates, change in procedures. Um, it's, you know, you might say rhetorically, we're going to march on Washington. That's not a call to violence, okay? So uh, we spend an entire class, I teach media law in the what used to be called the journalism school at OSU, now it's the School of Media and Strategic Communications. I teach media law and we'll spend a whole day just on Brandenburg trying to understand what speech is protected and what tiny little part of speech is. So there are a couple of other terms here that I'd like you to know, sort of educate you about the First Amendment. One of them is the term state action. And it doesn't mean like Oklahoma state, it means the generic term government. So for the First Amendment to apply in your situation, 
government has to be involved in the censorship. So what that means is private organizations and private businesses under the First Amendment can censor you as an employee, can fire you for what you say. Now, there are some states, we're not one of them in Oklahoma, but there are some states that have statutes that prohibit employers for firing, from firing people for their political speech or political activity. But under the First Amendment, uh, for example, uh, a network, TV network or a radio network could fire one of its employees, on-air talent, who has said things that are offensive. And the, the company can say, well, you are offending our listeners, our business, we're going to get rid of you. But government has a lot of trouble doing that. The First Amendment protects us from government action. Uh, so when you hear someone saying the First Amendment protects them from private action, that's not correct. It protects us, importantly, from what government does. So now the next term you should understand, concept, is preferred position. So that means that when government tries to censor speech, press, religion, the right to redress government for grievances, to uh, assemble peacefully. When government tries to uh, censor that, infringe on those rights, the, the speech, the right is placed way up here. It's given a preferred position. And the government attempt is way down here. And that government attempt is presumed to be unconstitutional. It's not permitted. So to get up over that hurdle, government's going to have to justify what it's doing. It's going to have to show to a court that this is not a violation of the First Amendment because, and if it's political, social, religious speech, the government has to have a compelling interest. And that usually means something like health, safety, and welfare of the public. So why is that important? Because the burden falls on government. Government has to go to court and prove that its restriction is justified, as opposed to you, the speaker, having to go to court and explain why your speech should be justified. That's a big difference. You don't want to go into court having the burden of proof. You want that to fall on the other side. So those are two important terms. There are also some important principles uh, that you should understand. First is, why do we need the First Amendment. Why, why do we have it? Why does it exist? And if you think you've got an answer, please type it in the con uh, comments. Let's see that you're out there and you're working on this. But why do you think we have protection for speech and press, religion, redress, <clears throat> government for grievances to uh, peacefully assemble? Why do these things exist in our federal constitution and in some version and other, some other wording usually uh, in our state constitutions? And the, the reason is because we don't need it to protect popular speech, speech that everybody likes, nobody complains about, nobody's trying to stop it. But when you put out music with lyrics that uh, older people like me suddenly object to. They forget about the music they listened to when they were younger. Uh, when you have content on television, suddenly people don't like, or content on movies, or political speech, where someone's advocating an idea that others don't like. That's when we need the First Amendment. Uh, I'll give you a quote from Gene Polozinski, and he spoke at our First Amendment Congress back in 05. And he said, you know, we don't need it to protect popular speech. We need it to protect the fringes of society, to listen to the voices we would rather not hear, to consider the ideas we would rather not consider. And sometimes those fringe elements end up in the mainstream, end up being accepted. Uh, abolitionists in the South were not considered uh, a mainstream idea even a part, uh, across other parts of the country at first. Civil rights movement, 
not considered a mainstream idea in a lot of parts of this country. But they've obviously won their way through. And the only way you can do that is having a marketplace of ideas. Probably the most used First Amendment theory by the U.S. Supreme Court. Marketplace of ideas. The idea should come out there, let truth and falsehood grapple. Whoever knew truth put to the worse in a free and open encounter. And that phrase comes from John Milton. If you've ever had to read um, some from John Milton in uh, Old English, I know it's difficult, but he wrote something called Arapagitica. And it was a brochure, a pamphlet, arguing against censorship, prior restraint by the British crown. You had to have a license in order to publish. And a lot of what we consider First Amendment ideas now actually come out of that. And for example, one was the idea that who among us is smartest, so smart that you can decide for everyone else what gets into that marketplace of ideas. So we want ideas that are everything people believe in to be there. But we want other ideas that come in and challenge. And then, and it works best when it's on a small, uh, like a college campus, it tends to work better. We come to some consensus on which ideas are best, which, which solutions to government problems are best. So the idea again is that we need a marketplace where these ideas compete because it, you really can't say an idea is false as you can with false advertising. Another category of unprotected speech is false and misleading advertising. That's easier to prove. False idea is difficult and it needs to be considered by the group, all of us. So another idea that comes through comes out of uh, New York Times v. Sullivan. And that's probably the most, first, uh, most uh, famous First Amendment case there is. It deals with libel, by the way, not out of a newspaper story, but out of an advertisement. And out of New York Times uh, v. Sullivan, the court said that there's a, a profound national commitment in this country that we should have robust, wide open, uninhibited discussions. Public debate should be robust, uninhibited, wide open. That doesn't mean it's always civil. The court recognized that. In fact, it said sometimes uh, speech serves its purpose best when it actually brings about dispute and stirs people to anger. So it's not about always being civil. Our system has always recognized that people will get angry. In fact, uh, we had a justice uh, in, in was in one of those earlier cases before we quite got to um, Brandenburg test was uh, shaping uh, the uh, clear and present danger test who talked about even ideas we think fraught with death should be protected unless they so imminently uh, imperil our country that immediate action is needed. Another idea comes out of Texas v. Johnson, and this has to do with burning flags as a means of protest. That will make people angry. Burning a flat, an American flag as protest and this occurred down in Texas and Dallas, and people were incensed that this man was doing this as a means of protest. And it went to the US Supreme Court, and the court said, again, we have this, this underlying bedrock principle of the First Amendment, and that is that government may not stop an idea simply because society finds the idea itself offensive. We have a this bedrock principle is that we don't allow government to stop ideas simply because everyone else finds the idea offensive. And so that's the case that says flag burning as a means of protest is protected speech. Um, by the way, hate speech, uh, this rather nebulous term hate speech um, is protected by the First Amendment. Um, the US Supreme Court has said that multiple times in different ways. Uh, one was a case involving uh, the term, the slants. 
And that's a band of Asian Americans who said, we're going to call ourselves a derogatory term we've been called our entire lives, slant, slant-eyed. We're going to adopt it and make it powerful for us. And they wanted to trademark that name for their band. And the United States uh, uh, Patent and Trademark Office said, no, that's, um, that's slanderous. Uh, it's offensive. And the U.S. Supreme Court said, we don't allow government to decide those things when it comes to a trademark. Uh, that is a term that can be trademarked. It's protected, even though clearly some people would find that an offensive term. Uh, in this case, perhaps less so because the band is adopting it for their own name. But the idea that offensive is alone is not enough to stop speech. So let's talk about how those uh, ideas evolve in the First Amendment cases that deal with you at, at school. Now, remember, state action means that there has to be government involved. So if you're at a private school, then the First Amendment doesn't protect you. You might have contract. In other words, when your parents signed up to send you there, uh, was there any uh, agreement on what rights students would be given? If there's not, you can't rely on the First Amendment or your state constitution to protect you in, the, in that regard for speech and press. But if you're a public student, and then we have some cases that have gone through the U.S. Supreme Court um, that say, Here's, here are what your rights are. And the first one you, I hope you've heard of is called Tinker. In fact, uh, it was uh, uh, some family members, along with some other students, uh, the Tinkers, uh, one of them actually spoke to our First Amendment Congress years ago. Most non-belligerent man you ever meet. And yet he has stood up for his rights and the rights of others. He's very polite, very humble. But he knows what his rights are and he knows what his principles are. And he stood up for him. So this case is back in the late 60s during the Vietnam War. And you can probably tell I'm old enough that I was around at that time. So protest against the Vietnam War. If we, we think we're a divided country now. That was another time when this country was bitterly divided. And so these students were wanted to protest at high school to protest the Vietnam War. And they were going to do so by wearing black armbands. And this is a, a rather old custom, but people used to wear black armbands to, to demonstrate, to signify that they were in mourning. So the students said, well, we're going to wear these to, to mourn for the soldiers, our soldiers, their soldiers, the um, residents, the people, everyone who's a civilian, everyone who has died in this war. And we're going to wear this to signify that we think the war is wrong. So the principal heard about it and he calls them all into his office. I don't want you doing this. You can't wear these. Well, that got rid of most of the students. They said, okay, well, I'm a, I don't want to be suspended or expelled, so I'm not going to participate. But this core of students who believed in what they were saying decided to wear it. Now, they don't know that their case is going to end up before the U.S. Supreme Court. They have no idea. You, you can't guarantee that your case will be heard by the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court uh, has discretion to which cases it hears, and it hears a tiny percentage of the petitions it receives each year. They had no idea if it went there, they would win. That took a lot of guts. That took a lot of courage. And again, respectful people still wore their armbands, and they were suspended. And so they fought this in court. And it makes its way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the court says, lays down a fundamental principle. It says students and teachers do not shed their First Amendment rights, their constitutional rights, when they pass through that schoolhouse gate. They don't shed them at the schoolhouse gate. So if you're a public student, you still have First Amendment rights. 
What's more, the court also said that while it's not absolute protection, school officials can't censor simply because they have some undifferentiated apprehension that some problem will be caused. In other words, they can't, and they also, the court said, can't stop it simply because they themselves find the idea offensive or they fear that other people will find it offensive. So what that means is, the court said, administrators can censor student speech when they can show that that speech would likely cause a substantial disruption or material interference with school activities, the discipline necessary to have school. Uh, again, that's some uh, modifiers on there. You know, substantial disruption, not just any disruption. You know, material interference with, not just any interference with. So it set the bar high. Again, administrators can't simply say, we're not going to let you speak because other people are offended by the political message you wear on your shirt or your button or your particular religion. That is important. Now, again, it's not absolute, but that's pretty high bar that says you still get to express your personal social, political, religious beliefs at a public school, okay? Now, the next case that comes up, well, let's, let's go back a second. I'll, I'll use a point here on what substantial disruption means, and it means that the student speech must cause it. So, for example, in Florida years ago, there was a principal who was uh, opposed to gays and lesbians. And he knew that one of the students, uh, his female student, was a lesbian. And he called her into his office and said, <clears throat> I want you to quit talking to the younger students about this. And I will suspend you if you continue to wear, uh, you know, your gay pride buttons and shirts, your rainbow buttons. And other students, her friends and other students stood up for her. And they started wearing gay pride, you know, rainbow buttons. They wore shirts, T-shirts. They stood up for her. And the principal was so outraged and angered by this that he began suspending these students. And it wasn't one or two. It was like a dozen students or more. And he's suspending them. And those students fought that in court. And they went to a federal district judge. When you when you. When you stand up for your First Amendment rights, you go to federal district court to start with. So they go to federal district court and the, the judge says uh, what this man <clears throat> has done is wrong. And when the school district tried to argue that the student's speech had caused the substantial disruption, all these students being suspended, the judge pointed out that it wasn't the students doing that. It was the administrator who was doing that that the administrator was suspending all these students. He was causing uh, the substantial disruption. Now, the kicker to this is uh, they ended up demoting him. And for a while, he worked in the administration office, but then they let him go back and they gave him the option to become a teacher. And the class he was going to teach was basically principles of American government. And here's a man who clearly did not understand American government, the principles of our system, uh, but was going to be teaching. Uh, so uh, here's another example I use on substantial disruption, material interference. There was another case out of Florida in which a student showed up for Halloween with a T-shirt that had condom packages attached to it. And she was handing these condoms out to her students. And the principal was outraged. You cannot do this at our school. And her mother defended her and said, she's doing this because she has friends who have, uh, you know, female friends who have unwanted pregnancies. She has friends who've, um, you know, come down with STDs 
because of their unprotected sexual activity. So she cares about these other people and she is handing these out as a message to have protected sex. Now that case, as far as I, I couldn't find it, ever went to court, it made the news. But did that student cause a substantial disruption, a material interference with school activities? And I would doubt that. Uh, she's entitled to hand out um, her message uh, before class, uh, before school starts, afterward, between classes, as long as it's not causing a substantial disruption. Now, an example of what might cause a substantial disruption, material interference, has dealt with um, the wearing of Confederate flags on clothing at schools where there is a history of racially motivated violence. And courts have said that is an example of where the administrators are able to bring evidence to court to show that we've already had problems. Uh, we've had violence in our schools based on race. And this is simply um, motivating, you know, inciting more violence. And <clears throat> those cases, the administrations have been upheld. So there's a difference between simply wearing an armband and then actually having someone inciting violence in your school. Uh, that symbolic speech that is wearing the armband, for example. Uh, there are students who've been suspended across the country for wearing other gay pride material. Those have generally been then overturned by the courts when they're fought. Courts say that's not a substantial disruption. And some of the argument by the school administrators has been, well, if we allow you to wear your gay pride shirt, then other students who are not tolerant will beat you up. That is not a justification for stopping someone's speech. Um, that's actually called a heckler's veto. And the system we have in this country says that government is required to stop the people who are the least tolerant from actually acting violently toward the speaker. Uh, that's why you'll see maybe at a protest, two groups that are screaming at each other and there are police in between them. The protesters and the protesters of the protesters are allowed to speak. Government, police, keep them apart. Well, in a school system, that would mean the government, the school administrator, needs to take action to stop and punish those who would actually take violence on someone for speaking their mind. Uh, we had another student uh, was up in Dearborn, Michigan, who was suspended for wearing a T-shirt that said, um, uh, had a big picture of George Bush at the time, uh, and it had a big circle with an X through and above it, it said international and below it said terrorist, international terrorist. And this student went to a school that was predominantly um, uh, students whose families had come from the Middle East. And his message was, I believe that the man who has started this war in Iraq is an international terrorist. Now, that might make some students very angry. He was suspended when a teacher noticed that he was wearing that in the cafeteria and he was brought into the principal's office and the principal said, you've got to take that off, go home, replace it, turn it inside out, something, you can't have that. Well, when it went to court, the student pointed out he'd worn it several times before no one had noticed. Students were not um, substantially disrupted. The educational activities were not materially interfered with because he was wearing his political message. And you see an analogy there, the, the similarities between that and the Tinker case, the symbolic speech. And so unsurprisingly, the federal judge in that case upheld the student's rights and said the administration was wrong for suspending him for wearing that shirt. At the same time, we have another student in another place who's suspended for wearing a shirt that says whack Iraq. So that's still a political message. Now, it doesn't mean, for example, 
um, courts have said uh, having holes in your genes uh, is not a political message. So schools have some authority over dress codes. Uh, length of hair has been an issue in our state years ago, and court said uh, the district didn't show any link between learning and length of hair, which affects a student far beyond the school day. That's 24 seven for a student. So what constitutes a substantial disruption, material interference um, is really, as we say in the law, it's always fact-based. What's that situation like? But remember, you have a right under Tinker to express your political, social, religious uh, values and beliefs. Again, that won't mean, uh, that means that government, the administration can stop you from wearing cigarette advertising, liquor, um, and indecent material, because indecent material for minors is not protected. So let's move to the next case. It's called um, the Bethel case. And this involves uh, students speaking at a uh, high school assembly in support of another student running for student government office. And the student's speech is filled with sexual innuendos. And he says stupid things like, uh, he's firm in his pants. And so the school assembly, the students are just going nuts at this. Some of them are laughing. The court later pointed out uh, some of them were embarrassed. You know, freshmen in high school are fairly young. And this, they ended up that the court drew a distinction between this case and Tinker. Even though the young man's speech was political, the court said in, the difference is that this was in school-sponsored expression, a school-sponsored environment. It wasn't just his personal belief. It was in a situation the school was sponsoring. So now we've got a divergence. We have Tinker on one side and starting to diverge away with uh, Bethel. And the next case, and if you've worked at a student newspaper uh, in your high school, you may have heard of this case. It's called Hazelwood. And Hazelwood goes further with Bethel and says that school administrators have a great deal of authority to control what is put out in the student newspaper. Now, that's as that's when the, the school newspaper is produced as part of the curriculum, as part of your class. You're getting credit hours for it. The teacher, the school, the principal can regulate that. Doesn't have to, is not required to. And there are schools around the country where states, I'm sorry, where principals have said, no, we're not going to do this. In fact, we had some years ago, um, a principal, a teacher, and the student editor came and spoke at the conference because the principal had okayed. He did not normally do prior restraint. He wasn't insisting on doing it this time. The teacher and the students went to him to give him a heads up that they were doing a set of stories about uh, sex, but in particular, oral sex. This was back during the Bill Clinton era, and <clears throat> students were treating oral sex as though it had no psychological effects, that they couldn't get a disease. And the students didn't do something that was um, sensationalist. They wrote fact-based stories about, yes, you can get diseases. They talked to experts about the psychological effects, that this is you know, still a sexual act. And the some of the parents were outraged and they went to the school board and tried to get this principal fired. Uh, the school board didn't do it. So if this man had allowed his students to deal with a serious issue. Now, how many of you know someone, a young woman who has had an unwanted pregnancy? How many of you know someone, one of your friends has got an STD through unprotected sex? These are important issues. Um, Hazelwood dealt with stopping stories that dealt with divorce. Well, divorce happens. Only about 25% of Oklahomans ever go on to earn a college degree. My point is, if you don't learn to deal with serious issues, actually at your school, to have those kind of discussions, then where do you learn to do it? You're not 
most Oklahomans don't go on to college. And even if they go to college, they may not have a class or something in an environment where they learn to deal with those. So if we're going to have that meaningful marketplace of ideas occur, then we need to have high school students learning how to deal with difficult adult subjects before they leave and graduate and go out into the real world. <clears throat> now, the last case to deal with quickly here is what I call bong hits for Jesus, because this was up in Alaska and some students, uh, as, a, as it was during the Olympics and the Olympic torch went by the school. And as it does, uh, all the students had been let out of the school to go watch the torch go by. And the students who did this had never even gone onto school grounds that morning. Uh, they were late to school. They're across the street and TV cameras are on and they unfurl this banner that says bong hits for Jesus. I have no idea what that means. It was just nonsensical. But they were suspended and they fought there. Uh, they fought for their rights and they actually won at the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, which gave them the benefit of the doubt that this was political speech. But the U.S. Supreme Court took their rights away and said that if student speech could be reasonably interpreted as encouraging illegal drug use, then that speech could be censored. So that takes another bite out of tinker. Uh, that your right to speak your personal beliefs. But the court did say, the, the opinions did say, uh, concurring opinions did say, but this is not about politics. So if your state, and Alaska had had this several times, has a referendum on whether to legalize, for example, marijuana, students are protected. They're entitled to share their views on that political issue, but not encourage other students to do illegal drugs. So if there are uh, questions here, we've got a few minutes. I wanted to leave some time. If there's something that's happened, for example, if you've, if you've ever been told in school that you can't wear uh, one of the little wrist bracelets that says, I heart boobies. We've had two federal circuits say those are protected speech. That's social speech. It's not that outrageous. So do we have, any comments, uh, Andy, if you can help me out there? Sure. I don't see any comments yet, but we'll give folks just a minute. Uh, folks, if you're watching at home or school or work or wherever, please feel free to drop a comment in the chat. Um, I've been trying to start from that side. I think if you're watching on Facebook, uh, it may not work as well because it's a Facebook group rather than a page. And apparently that's an issue. Go figure. Uh, but this has been great. I uh, I was trying to think up any other questions that we typically get during this. Um, and the, the thing that stood out to me uh, as it has in the past is the bong hits for Jesus. I remember that from previous years. Um, when, uh, when I was in school, um, we ran into some of the same issues you mentioned, uh, things like bracelets and t-shirts in this general sense that oh, you can't say that here because you you might upset other people. And is that what you said was a heckler's veto? Is Like when the government well, is saying you can't do something because it might upset somebody else? Not just upset them, and they can't do it simply because it's going to offend other people, but the heckler's veto would go a step further where administrators will say, and this tends to be with, with uh, uh, pro-gay and lesbian uh, messages. No, other people are so intolerant at our school students that they will beat you up. And that's right. a heckler's veto when they actually stop the speech uh, because someone is violent against that speaker. I'm going to go search the names of all the super PACs and see if heckler's veto is already a super PAC. That's a good, a good name for that. Uh, just on that note, though, so I, I can hear school administrators saying, well, maybe it's not against the law, but it's against our policy. Do school policies have the same effect as law or in this situation, are they regarded the same? A school policy cannot supersede your federal constitutional or state constitutional rights. Those those policies must comply with this law, which would be you know, the First Amendment. Uh, right. Constitutions outweigh school policy. So, uh, you know, we've had example a few years ago at um, Deer Creek, 
where a student was suspended for wearing a shirt that uh, said Black Lives Matter. Uh, and he'd worn it several times before someone noticed. And the school said it had a policy of um, not allowing speech that was divisive. And, and he made an uproar and the ACLU went to bat for him uh, and, and the school rethought that, that policy. Uh, that was sure. clearly political speech he was entitled to have. Right. Interesting. Well, Dr. Sennett, thank you again. This has been, this has been great as always. Uh, thanks for being here and have a, a great rest of the day. You too. Thank you, everybody. And you're always welcome to email me if you have questions about your First Amendment rights and you can find me at OSU. And I will, if I need to, forward those on to some other folks who are attorneys and we'll try to help you out. Right. Hey, before you go, uh, we have one question that just came in from Laura Akers, who will be here in our third session. But she asks, uh, Dr. Sennett, do you have any ideas for how to increase public knowledge around knowing the five freedoms in the first in, of the First Amendment? Yeah. And of course, this this session is one of those. Um, we, we need more real education in K through 12. Uh, by the way, FOI Oklahoma used to sponsor some um, lesson plans for students, uh, for teachers uh, to teach students about their five rights. And so we each and every one of us sort of need to take it on personally to uh, learn them and teach others about them uh, and confront ignorance uh, when we can. Right. And we actually have that um, that curriculum still on our website. I will drop it into the chat right now. There's a link to it. It's pretty great. Um, it is a great resource. And so if you are a, an educator out there and you're looking for a curriculum to use, um, that's a great place to start. And a lot of it can be used in a distance learning format like we're in right now. Okay, super. Well, uh, again, thank you for being here. Thank have you. a great rest of the day. All right, folks, uh, well, that brings us to the end of the first session. We're going to take uh, about a 10-minute break to get it set up for the next session. And during that break, we're going to do a news quiz, uh, as we do every year. Uh, and the next session, we'll be joined by representatives from Generation Citizen uh, to learn about how they're making civic education and actually changing the world for the better. Uh, so for the news quiz... I'm going to share my screen right now. Whoop. Hey. Uh, so if you will go to Kahoot, it's kahoot.it. Um, and you have to enter, you just go to that website and enter the pin that you will see at the left here. Um, and once a few folks sign in, um, then we can go through it. It's 16 questions. It goes pretty quick. Um, you have, I believe, 20 seconds to or to answer each one. And um, Kahoot. It. And um, you can you can click that. So we'll kind of hang out. I don't really know any jokes or good recipes, but we'll give it just a minute in case folks want to play the news quiz. This is an interactive game, um, and I can. Uh, click start and you will see the questions on the screen here and then on your screen or your phone uh, you can do it from a phone or a tablet um, you will be able to answer it that way and it shows up and if nobody wants to play then i'll sit, just sit here making small talk for a couple more minutes before we uh play the little video i hope that you guys uh, found that useful and while we're waiting um, another a facebook user says that they have a simple technique uh, for which they use with fifth and sixth graders to learn those five First Amendment rights, um, teaching them grasp, um, and, and or G is grip or grievance. That's a good a good technique. I love a good uh, a good acronym. Maybe it's from working in government for so many years, but I do love a good acronym. Okay. Well, no one has signed up for our news quiz game just yet. This is one of the downsides of doing it virtually. So I'm going to, uh, we'll just stop that and uh, we'll play a little quick break. I need to get some more coffee. And when we come back, we will visit with folks about Generation Citizen. So stay tuned.
up that music there. I hope you were grooving well at home uh, or in school. Dance party, that's fine. Uh, welcome back. This next session of the First Amendment Congress is about Generation Citizen, uh, which is an organization that believes that every student has the right to learn how to effectively participate as citizens. Generation Citizen inspires civic participation through a proven state standards aligned action civics class. It's a lot of buzzwords, but it gives students the opportunity to experience 
real world democracy. They started out in Rhode Island in 2008 and now have active programs in six states, including right here in Oklahoma. I am honored to say that I'm, I've been a, a member of the local board of Generation Citizen um, since they started here uh, uh, several years ago, and uh, it is tremendous. Um, I'm looking forward to this session. You get to see me the whole hour. I've got to moderate, and joining me to discuss this is the executive director from Oklahoma, Amy Curran. Hello, Amy. How are you? I'm great. Good morning. Thanks for being here. And Representative Daniel Pei um, is also here. We'll add him. Hey there. Well, we'll do the split screen this way. Representative Pei is a alumnus of Generation Citizen in Oklahoma and is now a state representative from the Lawton area. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Andy. And good morning, Amy. Hello. Thanks for being here to both of you. Uh, so I'm so excited. Amy, can you give us, a, I know I read a little prepared bio about the organization, but can you give us that next level explanation of what the organization is? Yeah, let's start with the action civics uh, buzzword. Uh, basically, it is uh, exactly what it sounds like. It is teaching civics through actually participating in local policy. So what we do is um, typically in a government class, but we work in Oklahoma history, lots of different social studies courses, depending on the school district we're working with. Um, while they are learning all of their other curriculum, um, as they are hitting pieces that um, affect government, they are um, given the opportunity to identify community issues that they care about, that they think they would like to change, and work through the full um, a full semester of identifying um, root causes, identifying then a policy goal, then who is it that could actually affect change, um, who can help them get more information about it, and then they can they create a full action plan and start implementing that action, um, really addressing issues that they care about from a policy perspective, um, when many of them, most of them, um, are not even old enough to vote at the time they're doing it. Sure, that's tremendous. Uh, Representative Pei, would you mind uh, telling the audience a little bit about your experience working with Generation Citizen? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, appreciate uh, everyone who is tuning in. Uh, I know uh, 2020 has been a very weird year for all of us, and we're all used to uh, meeting virtually in this um, format. Uh, and so definitely when it comes to Generation Citizen, uh, it was a lot of fun. My final uh, semester when I was at the University of Oklahoma, uh, as you might imagine, as a senior, uh, you have a lot of free time on your hands. And so I wanted to uh, be productive uh, while I was uh, con concluding my academic career uh, at the time. And so Mamie uh, in the student government office one day as she was uh, trying to recruit um, democracy coaches. And so after doing some research, uh, I decided to sign up. And uh, it was a lot of fun uh, that semester. I remember I was at Norman North High School, uh, the students that uh, I taught decided to focus on uh, Norman water issues, and so I learned a lot about the city of Norman and some of the challenges they're going through. And I think that's the main point: is that yes, a lot of federal, uh, specifically presidential politics, uh, takes out the oxygen in our news cycles, but it's really at the local level that a lot of impactful decisions are made. And emphasizing that to young people is crucial in the long run, making sure they're uh, civically engaged. Um, at the level that really matters in the end. So happy to be part of Generation Citizen and uh, always happy to help Amy out when it comes to programs and opportunities like this, uh, just to talk to young people. Yeah, so one of the things that has always stood out to me about Generation Citizen is that is the action piece, right? That it is based around actually being involved. And Amy, you talked about this a little bit, but can you Tell us, you know, what exactly students do during a semester while they're involved in the course, um, kind of that step-by-step -step of root cause analysis and all of that. Yeah, absolutely. And and there was an example that um, Dr. Sinnott gave for, uh, a minute ago about dress code. And we recently had, um, so I can kind of go through one of those classes. And in Pawnee, we have a, uh, a some classes going on in Pawnee, Oklahoma, and there was a dress code issue based around that was around um, piercings um, on male students, um, which is a very much uh, a culture of um, 
the the Pawnee uh, nation there, but in school they weren't allowed to wear their piercings, and so the um and, and there was also an issue around the length of hair, I believe, and so that became an issue because lots of students were um, active members of their tribe and and felt strongly that that should be something that the school should take under you know under consideration. And so what they did was they did a bunch of research to see what other school districts did around this issue. I'm assuming that they also recognized um, and found, you know, back to um, the First Amendment that that school policy is not able to override constitutional rights. And so um, they worked through all of that instead of, you know, protesting and doing things that students often want to do because that's just, you know, sort of the human instinct in all of us is like, go out, take it to the streets. They recognized that they were able to do research um, and uh, identify the policy of goal of having the school district change that policy. They actually reached out and spoke to um, the school board members prior to, were invited to come and speak at a school board meeting and it came to a vote and, and, and now that policy has, has changed. Um, because of what those students did. So that's sort of like a, a rough around kind of, a, you know, specifically addressing um, First Amendment, but it's something that I, our students, you know, were able to do. And I think it makes a big difference when it's coming from the student perspective and not adults in the community, not necessarily even tribal leaders or their parents, but it's students saying, you know, speaking on their own behalf, that that's something that they want to do in their school. Um, so I don't know, does that answer your question, kind of how it, Yes. Yes. No, that's great. That's a really salient example, I think, for today in particular. When I think about Generation Citizen, I, you know, one of the, the marquee events, right, is is um, Civics Day, uh, which we had held at the Capitol until it was too crowded. And then we had to find a bigger space because we've the organization has grown and we have more and more student groups that are doing this. And that example you gave is, you know, I is one that I hadn't seen yet. I think of ones like what Representative Pay mentioned, um, where it was a group of students in Norman who were concerned about the water quality, right? And the level of arsenic in the water. And when they sat down at the beginning of the semester, they identified that as their chief concern and wanted to build a project around that. And so how they, um, how they identified not just the problem, but who has control over that, who has influence over that and started reaching out. Uh, and I, there's a ton of examples, right, from criminal justice reform and hearing from students who had mothers that were currently incarcerated. And here the student was in the rotunda of the state capitol saying, well, I've been trying to fix this as a high school student. Surely the legislature or someone else can um, can stand up and, and be involved in that. Right. Well, and you think of, of the role, like civics education in schools, like it's one thing for students to be doing that sort of on their free time, but they're, you know, students are, they have a full-time job in school. And so one of the things that Generation Citizen focuses on is really having um, real world um, opportunities because we're gonna spend eight plus hours in school every day. You might as well be doing something and learning how to be a citizen within your community. And I think that's really important. And, and students offer a really important um, perspective. Um, one issue that comes up in a variety of different things is around school safety and what stu what students ask for to feel safe in their school. And it often aligns with what people, you know, outside of schools believe makes them safe, but it, many times it doesn't. Um, you know, and so getting that perspective, recognizing, and even when I go to my own children's school, you know, recognizing that is their space. I'm a visitor in their space and they get to be a part of um, helping uh, that community protect them, protect their peers, um, protect their teachers. They're very concerned um, about their teachers' well-being. Um, and so a lot of times we'll have projects around teachers and um, their experiences. I mean, that's who students are with all the time. So it's just really interesting to watch um, how they think through these type of things. And, and the hope is that, you know, they take that, you know, like I just gave an example, a very specific example around, um, you know, dress code 
the skills that they learn working through that project apply to so many other things. So they take that, you know, one project and while it may not have to do with dress code, it may be school safety or public health or whatever, they now have the skills to go out and identify those root causes and, and understand the system that allows um, the world to become more representative of their worldview. Sure. Yeah. Representative Pay as someone who, you know, started out as a democracy coach. Um, tell us a little bit what about what that role is like, particularly because I'm I believe we have students who are watching today that are in high school and will be moving on to college and could not just even if they can't participate in um, in Generation Citizen as a high school student, once they're in college, there may be other opportunities to be a democracy coach. So tell us a little bit more about what that looks like. Uh, absolutely. And so from the beginning, you have to uh, learn all the various terminologies related to Generation Citizen, whether that's the Apex to Hourglass, Action Civics, etc., uh, to be knowledgeable in those subject matters. Uh, my dog just walked into the room. Hey there. Uh, and then from there, um, I would say uh, it's about letting the students talk more uh, than you talk. You want to make sure you facilitate uh, a very honest and robust uh, conversation. Uh, so you're more of a facilitator, you're trying to ask probing questions and get uh, a good discussion going on. Uh, that way, uh, for the student's perspective, it's a good practice run uh, as far as teaching them how do I articulate my thoughts? How do I, if I disagree with someone, I don't really agree with what they're saying, how do I uh, express that? Uh, while not being disagreeable. Um, and so throughout the semester, you, you're a mentor for sure, uh, and you're trying to uh, show the students uh, what it takes to get policy changes uh, happening. And I think it's really cool for them uh, to meet local elected officials. Uh, for example, in our class, I contacted uh, one of the city council members, Stephen Holman, I contacted a former uh, mayor, Cindy Rosenthal, and so they got to come to class and uh, talk to students about their experiences because uh, oftentimes you may just see them on the news or on a Facebook post, but you not you might not see them in the flesh. And so that's a big difference right there. Um, so I tried to uh, leverage my connections and bring those types of folks to the classroom. Uh, but in general, just let them uh, discuss amongst each other. Um, and then when it came time to civics day planning for that, um, having them work together as far as uh, what to put on the board, what not to put on the board, and how to have all the information, all the research they did throughout the semester uh, succinctly produced uh, on that one poster board. Um, so those are very important life skills no matter what um, career path they ultimately uh, may choose. And hopefully uh, they'll continue to be engaged and uh, thoughtful in how they read the news and um, discuss uh, politics with their peers. Sure, I, you know, whenever I talk to students, there's and including my own children, right? There's frustration about things they learn in school that they don't know that they'll ever use in real life. Um, and I'm old enough to have had home economics. And so as I made an omelet for breakfast this morning, I remember making an omelet in my eighth grade home ec class. That is a useful skill, but action civics is useful in a whole other way, right? It is something that, that you put into place, um, not just when you vote, but in how you go about your life and, and understanding um, that you have a voice and you can be involved in helping solve the problems of your community, big and small, right? So whether it's uh, whether it's a, a school policy, whether it's arsenic in the water, whether it's criminal justice reform, uh, whether it's a lack of sidewalks um, or too many potholes, like there are ways that we can all be involved. And it's, I think, really inspiring to see you know, young people that are learning this and putting it into place. Representative Pei, now that you have seen things from the other side as a member of the state legislature for the last couple of years, um, what I know that you've been involved because I've seen you at Civics Day. Tell me what your perspective is now and how that has evolved over time since you've uh, been, been in elected office. Yeah, well, it's definitely humbling. Um, so I've been uh, in office two years and was reelected to two more years uh, a month ago. And so um, I interned at the state capitol while I was in college. Uh, so it's very surreal anytime I'm walking around the rotunda or I'm going to my office now, knowing that's where I work, uh, that's where my day job's at. Um, and so I always enjoy these opportunities to tell young people who do want to run for office themselves, perhaps in the near future, 
uh, don't be intimidated or discouraged by folks who may say uh, you don't have enough uh, life experience. Um, there are plenty of older folks who got elected, frankly, who uh, don't know how to listen, they don't know how to co collaborate. Um, and these are uh, skills you don't need to be 50, 60 years old. Uh, we have a lot of great young people uh, who have unique perspectives uh, that, that ought to be at the table. Um, and so the um, going back to Generation Citizen, the, the action uh, civics process, uh, starting with an idea and then going, going through the entire uh, steps ahead, uh, that's very similar to legislating. Uh, we all, all 101 of us in the House have various um, ideas based on our constituencies. Uh, and so the challenge is um, going through committees, going through the Chamber of Origin, and then starting over on the other side of the building. Um, all that requires uh, salesmanship in a way. All that requires a lot of research and knowing uh, what exactly you're trying to propose and then selling that uh, to, to my colleagues. Uh, so some folks, you know, they just kind of uh, think that um, they don't need to do any of the hard work. But, you know, in general, in order to be an effective legislator, uh, you have to make sure that you're talking to um, your colleagues uh, consistently, uh, both in the majority and minority parties. Uh, honestly, you got to make sure that you're answering questions, you're being open and accessible. Uh, and so anytime that I have a bill on the committee agenda, uh, I go talk to each of the uh, committee members, Republican or Democrat, um, and answer the questions ahead of time. And it, and sometimes they even have suggestions for amendments. So I try to incorporate those into the bill. Uh, but it's a very collaborative uh, process. It's very relationship-oriented um, process. You can't do it uh, by yourself. That's not how the system or how the process is designed. And so I think a generation citizen uh, definitely emphasizes those types of ideals. Uh, and so having gone through that in, in college, uh, as well as my experience in Student Government Association, uh, having served as student body president, um, it was a very uh, similar role. Uh, and so there, there isn't necessarily a playbook overall when it comes to being a, a legislator. Uh, but in my view, I think just uh, having an open mind, uh, being accessible, um, and trying to uh, build coalitions. Uh, those are all the, the key ingredients to being effective. Yeah. Yeah, Amy. we are we are really proud of of, of Representative Pei. He's the first generation citizen alumnus to be elected into office um, for the organization. Um, I'm I'm sure we have more now, but that was pretty exciting. And one of the things, um, Representative Pei, I don't know if you remember this, but I came and talked to you in your office not long after you were elected, and and was asking, I just was curious, like what from your generation citizen experience, like how, like has impacted how you lead. Um, and one of the things you said made me really proud. Um, and I hope it's what everyone who works with generation citizen feels, but it was listening to other people before you make a decision, like making sure that you hear the voices of everyone concerned. And I think, um, again, tying this back to um, the First Amendment and to student perspective, there are so many things. Um, so students listening, you know, if you've listened to um, debate on the floor of either the House or the Senate or and you hear people talk and they're constantly saying um, things like what's best for kids. I want to do what's best for kids. And you hear people on different sides of the same issue saying, I want to do what's best for kids. And whenever I hear that and if I get the opportunity to speak with them, I say, well, have you asked students what they think about that? And almost always it's no. <laughs> um, Representative Pei has been like really a model at the Capitol for listening to students and, and hearing their voice. Um, but it's just really critical because policies that are made now um, affect students for you know generate you know the long time you know a long time and if we aren't listening to what they need in their community and um, what they need to see in their schools um, I feel like we're really doing a disservice and so while Generation Citizen tries you know the best we can to do our part to provide our, our curriculum and almost as important as the curriculum is our teacher training because this is hard stuff for teachers to do um you know to have these conversations to have conversations about um you know controversial topics uh it's challenging and they get nervous about their own jobs when that happens but it's critical that we have those conversations um and that those conversations 
happen in the classroom and then they continue at our state capitol or at city council or at the school board because we, we just have to keep listening to students to, to make sure that we really are doing what's best for kids. Right. Yeah. We, yeah I want to build we, upon that point, uh, Amy, like, uh, you know, I think from the young people that I've spoken with, uh, a common thread is that they wish there was more emphasis on how to critically um, articulate um, their political positions and also per personal finances. Uh, those topics are kind of uh, laid to the wayside and not really uh, emphasized at the high school level. And so when they graduate, um, they don't have the basic foundation to be successful um, in those areas. And I don't think as, as young people that as far as those controversial um, topics, uh, we should be discussing them. We shouldn't be afraid to have open uh, dialogue. I'm really encouraged that uh, this year, uh, early in the summer with uh, the George Floyd protests, we had uh, younger demographics um, across various ethnicities um, coming together to march in support of uh, police reform and criminal justice reform. And I think that's what's going to make uh, those types of movements sustainable um, over the long run because they're so diverse um, and they're so inclusive of all these different uh, perspectives. Um, that's ultimately how change happen. Uh, going back to uh, discussing the First Amendment, um, I think this generation, whether it is uh, via in-person um, marches or via social media, uh, they have uh, really learned to maximize those types of um, uh, strategies and get their message out. And so I think that's what you're going to start seeing over the course of uh, the century. Amy, earlier you mentioned changes that that students had targeted at the school policy level, and we've talked about some at the city level. Since we've got a state representative here on the line with us, have have any of the the students' projects over the last several years resulted in legislation that has been proposed and or passed? Yes, a couple of years ago. Um, so this last session was really short. <laughs> <laughs> and because of COVID. Um, but a couple of years ago, we actually had five pieces of legislation that made it through committee. Um, two were passed, one was vetoed, um, and then the other actually made it into law. And I'm going to be embarrassed. I'm going to have to think for a second which of the two made it into law. I remember. I'm going to have to think about it. <laughs> yes. Um, they have had some. And, and you know, we get really excited and we follow the the policy as it goes through and um you know through now we have the civic learning coalition before the civic learning coalition we had sort of like an informal like group of people that would would follow legislation and and advocate as it came up in different pieces um but um we we don't want the goal necessarily to be like it became law. Like that is great. It is great when it does, but you know, and I know, and, and Representative Pay knows, like the win is often, you know, somewhere along the way. Um, and so, yes, we get very excited when they do that. I will say, you know, in our school board stuff has that more often shows up and actually becomes policy. Um, and even bigger than the, when they make policy change in the school board, I've seen school boards really change their perspective of how to engage students, mm -hmm. almost to the point of like, you know, I'm very big in them, you know, every time announcing how you make public comment, provide, you know, giving students the, not just access to do it, but informing them of the process along the way, so. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one thing that, you know, I've learned in, in my work with FOI and other organizations is that a lot of, you know, a lot of elected officials are very accessible. Representative Pay, you know, is willing to join us today. Um, many of them will give you their cell phone, you can get their email, and they'll be very accessible. And that's great, but then people don't know what to say or how to say it. And, uh, oh, okay, I've got his number, but what do I what do? I do? And so helping them understand and learn those skills, not just students, right? This is for adults too, that um, how to how to participate in a way that, that gets your point across clearly and concisely. And that I, you know, if action is needed, that there's uh, a clear actionable step. And I actually want to um, go back and, um, discuss real brief, briefly the bill that you said that got vetoed because um, i think that was the hiv education bill right and at the time i was working in at an hiv clinic right and um so it was something that i 
was concerned about and it came up totally separate right like this is something we had been working on for years and lo and behold a bunch of students were like yeah we care about that too and while it didn't the bill wasn't passed the the veto um memo from the governor's office had an effect of changing policy in some ways and so do you know uh, if it did get changed in statute you know i um well it's not in statute it was just a uh, rules change so oh, so the okay, issue right. for um for viewers is that the the state of oklahoma has an education mandate related to hiv education and it and it stipulates what that the educational curriculum about hiv and aids is supposed to be and not be and for years right um the state department of education had had kind of said like well we're not sure if we can go and teach some of these aspects like the science and some of the new stuff that had evolved the last time the bill was written was like back in the 80s and obviously a lot has changed with hiv in the in the last 40 years and so they were kind of hesitant because they didn't want to overstep their bounds. And so the governor's veto said, we don't need this as a law. The state department of education can make this change on their own. And so in my mind, or my interpretation of that is that the effect of this bill, um, while it wasn't passed, still had the end outcome of allowing the, the thing to change that needed to change. Uh, to your point, I don't know if they've actually done that or how that curriculum has evolved uh, because the last couple of years have been rather tumultuous when it comes to education and, and funding in our government. But uh, I but I think that's a good point that sometimes the way we define success has to be flexible or might vary from case to case. Uh, Representative Pay, have I know that you've only been in office for a couple of years. Have you been involved? Have any students come to you with specific um, issues or things that they wanted changed that were, whether they were related to generation citizen or not? Yeah, well, I was uh, volunteering as a judge. Uh, this would have been the fall of 2018, uh, shortly after uh, the election. And so uh, there was a table uh, of students and uh, their proposed topic was about uh, bullying. And uh, they had done some research and um, the CDC had developed a new definition of bullying. Uh, the only difference between the, the current and the new one would be that uh, in addition to a pattern of aggressive unwanted behavior toward another student, it's also any uh, one-time incident that can potentially lead to a pattern uh, over the long run. Uh, and so bullying is a very personal issue to me. Uh, we need, uh, should go through that. And um, it, uh, it uh, definitely spoke to me. I, um, was with the students, and so I offered to uh, um, get this bill uh, in my list of requests uh, for the upcoming session. And so uh, we were able to get it passed to the House uh, Common Ed Committee. Um, and then I worked with uh, Chair Representative Rhonda Baker. Uh, she uh, had authored a similar uh, piece of legislation uh, by then Senator Jason Smalley. And so Senator Smalley was able to pass it over in the Senate, uh, and then it kind of got stuck. Um, in the House uh, toward the end of the 2019 session. Uh, but it's my understanding that we're going to try again uh, next year, working with a few folks and trying to uh, get that legislation uh, passed. Uh, but yeah, that was uh, right after I got elected. Uh, one example of how a uh, generation, generation citizen uh, found a, a policy idea. And then uh, we got we got the attention raised about the issue. and. Uh, we got uh, significantly along the process. Um, and I think that's the key ultimately uh, is trying, when it comes to change, sometimes you gotta try multiple times over the course of a couple years. Um, it's very rare in the legislature that you can get significant change all in uh, one session. You have to be persistent um, and you have to continue um, getting at it uh, no matter what obstacles uh you may face uh and, and not giving up so we'll try again next year and uh see what happens sure yeah amy um to kind of back up how would tell us how many schools or how many districts that generation citizen is involved in in oklahoma right now over the course of the last four and a half years we've worked with around 20 districts i would guess okay that number right in front of me um any given just any given semester we work with about 10 to 12. Um, so some have kind of continued some 
you know, it depends on the teacher. Um, a couple of districts, particularly Oklahoma City Public Schools, we have been in from the very beginning, and we are actually in every middle and high school in Oklahoma City Public Schools. Um, and then we're expanding, you know, we've got, we're in schools in Tulsa, um, we've got schools in Guymon, um, we've, we're in Putnam City, we've been in Ninaka and Chickasha and, and lots of different things. So um, currently during this semester, we had 83 classes um, happening, even in the time of COVID, where they're doing, um, just many of them are doing distance learning. Um, some are, have been in person. Actually, I think they've all now, Guyman went um, virtual this week. Um, so all of our schools have at some point been virtual and that and that poses lots of other challenges, but it also poses lots of opportunity because so many of the decisions that are being made at the policy level around um, COVID um, involve students. And again, I ask my favorite question is, have you asked students what they want or what they need um, before we make um, you know, set policies and and address school safety, um, you know, in buildings that many people have, you know, the people making the decision will never visit a school. So it's important that we talk to students and to the teachers to see what it is that they need. Yeah. I Now, I know, you know, a big part of, of Generation Citizen is that the idea is that y'all come in and teach this action civics curriculum due to this void or this, you know, dearth of civics education that exists across the country. Um, how are you guys working to um, to get civics education kind of back into that core curriculum that's uh, the districts embrace? Yeah. So um, in Oklahoma, one semester of civics is required. Um, by the state. So everyone will have that. Now, sometimes they call it something different, which I think is interesting. <laughs> um, like some kind uh, of world history or? or yeah, or um, what was it? Norman calls it something different. Um, it's American democracy. I can't remember. Sure. It's something, again, it doesn't make sense. Like, let's just call it Jumping something. American yeah. But what is it? What did you say? Well, Laudan, why I took it was uh, just US government. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, we so what we would like to see is is the requirement that everyone have a full year of government and civics um, as a as a state requirement. Um, and then what we would really like to see is um, statewide legislation to have at least one semester of action civics or if you don't want to use the buzzword action civics, um, you know, just calling it what it is, which is project-based learning. So some kind of project where they're actually doing something and take, I mean, it's important just like in STEM that you not just learn scientific facts, but that you actually use those facts to make something happen or create something, some result. Um, and so we would like to see that happen in civics um, as well. So yeah. I think we could have action math, action biology, lots of actionable subjects that have a direct correlation with um, putting them into into place. Yeah. Uh, so we've got one question that I think is I was on my list to ask, and I'm going to put it on the screen from Laura Akers. How does an Oklahoma school district reach out to Generation Citizen to see about setting up a new partnership? Absolutely. So emailing me direct always works at acurrent at generationcitizen.org, but you can also go to our website, generationcitizen.org, and there's a link that says join us. And it's like, how do I become a class? And it can be a school administrator. It can be a teacher. It could be a student. Um, if we get emails from students saying they'd like that in their school, um, we often reach out to them and go in partnership with them to their principal and the school district to see um, what we can make happen. So even students watching, if they're interested and and one of the things that always impresses me the most um, about working with students is I know you have a lot of seniors here who wouldn't necessarily benefit from that because they're graduating, but they want to see that in, they, they think it would have been important for them and they want to see that for students coming through their school and they want to have that as their legacy. And so I'm always impressed when students are thinking in a forward direction like that. Sure. Yeah. So I put your email and the website in the 
in the chat. Hopefully everyone can see that, at least on YouTube. I don't think it went over to Facebook. Things are a little weird today, but uh, mm -hmm. hopefully we'll say that again. It's uh, acurren at generationcitizen.org. Yep. And the website, of course, then it's just generationcitizen.org. And again, uh, GC is a national organization. Um, they're in how many states? We are on the ground in six states. Okay. So Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New York, Texas, Oklahoma, and California. And then we have some remote sites where we, um, basically it's what it sounds like. We we work with teachers and school districts that are on a remote basis. Um, we've been in Utah, Kentucky, a few other states. So, Right. You know, I remember when, when the GC decided to expand to Oklahoma, the way it was explained to me by you or one of the national board members was, you know, they had started there on the East Coast and they wanted to expand into some different type of states, right? And so they said, uh, someone somewhat jokingly said, what about Oklahoma, um, which is not known for our civic engagement. In fact, you know, we still, even with, with voter turnout at a record high this year, Oklahoma still had the lowest voter turnout in the country of all the states, uh, or one of the lowest. And so they said, well, if we're going to go big, like if we're going to do this, let's go somewhere um, that we might not otherwise expect. And so they decided to come to Oklahoma and what a roaring success it's been um, to be in uh, 80 plus schools here is, is no small feat. Um, I remember starting out, it was, it felt like a huge deal to just be in a handful, but now to be in, you know, Oklahoma city public school district, a, the state's largest district um, and all of the middle school and high schools, that's a, that's an enormous deal. And, you know, after the first year or two, um, some of the national board members and, and the outgoing CEO, Scott Warren came and we had a, a meeting and lunch. And the question that I was asked was what's going on with Oklahoma students? Like <laughs> they are talking about issues that are like big, you know, adult <laughs> issues. Right. And I, I was like, what do you mean? And they said often in other States, the issues that students want to work on or that they identify are like small potatoes. Like it's not that school policy is not a big deal, but it's like, you know, uh, fluffy feel good things that are what you might expect, I guess, for a, a high school student to try to tackle. But in Oklahoma, they were addressing these issues like teacher pay and, um, you know, female incarceration rates and, poisonous water and like big systemic things that affect tens of thousands of people. And they, they were these, you know, some out of, out of state folks were amazed at oh, what we all knew to be true. They're like, you know, these are big things that um, most teenagers might not even be aware of what's going on here. And that was right in the, the peak of the, uh, as we were going into like the teacher walkout and, and some of those big issues to do with, uh, with state funding, the budget cuts we had in 2016 and 2017. Uh, and I, it even hit me that this was so stark to them that the fact is Oklahoma is, uh, Oklahomans of all ages care about our state. We care about our well-being, uh, and that includes high school students. And so anyone who is watching who thinks, oh, well, you know, kids don't care, they don't understand, that is distinctly not the case. And in fact, we stand out from other states. Um, well, and I, think, I think that comes from two places, almost polar opposites. One, Oklahoma, um, and students see this, <laughs> you know, we're at the top of all the, a lot of the wrong lists. And not only do they see that in the media, because they do see it in the media, but they experience it. You know, when we're working with like a student in Oklahoma City, the likelihood that they have a family member in prison is you know, through the roof. So they're not just reading about it in the media, they're experiencing it. So, you know, there are a lot of things like that that they want to address. I think there is a lot of pride in Oklahoma. I know, you know, I'm like fifth generation Oklahoman um, from Northwest Oklahoma. I have a lot of pride from being in Oklahoma, but I, I say, especially, you know, right now, I'm, I'm proud of my state for I know what it can be, not always for where we are right now, because we do have, you know, we have some real growth opportunities. Um, and then uh, I think the other thing is, is um, you know, looking at representative pay and, and other, we have a real, 
we have a state government that is accessible, more accessible than many people, um, you know, local government. Um, and so when you're in New York City public schools, I mean, they have so many students and it's such a big community that to reach out to city council would be, you know, and they do, and they're effective at it, but, you know, they also have like, you know, things within their school building that are important. Where in Oklahoma, you know, regardless of whether you're in Oklahoma City, Lawton or Ninaka, you have pretty accessible leaders. And so I think that lends itself to um, looking at those state issues in a way where maybe a lot of other places look more at municipal um, or school um, policy. Yeah. So we've got about nine minutes left. Um, Representative Pei, uh, from your perspective, anything, um, any words of wisdom, advice, suggestions that you might have for students or teachers who are looking for ways to incorporate more civics and more action civics into their educational curriculum? Uh, for sure. And I, I think uh, it'd be awesome to get generation citizen in every uh, school district across the state of Oklahoma. Uh, certainly Lawton, I think, could benefit uh, from it tremendously. Uh, but I think, you know, as far as from a teacher's perspective, the key is just to make sure to challenge your students to really think outside uh, what they're comfortable with and try to empathize uh, with other people who have different uh, perspectives. Uh, one thing that worries me about our modern politics is that empathy, um, caring about others, it's kind of been synonymous with uh, weakness as for, for whatever reason. I, I don't think that's the case at all. I think caring about others and understanding others about what the backgrounds are and why they uh, have the beliefs they have, I think that's crucial when it comes to uh, governing. Um, and so I think one one reason why you may see so many young people more civic engaged compared to um, other folks is that uh, they're sick and tired of just all the gridlock and dysfunction they've been watching uh, since they were kids. Um, you know, we haven't had this many government shutdowns and just standoffs in Congress uh, like we have in recent years. And that, that's what gives me hope, is that this rising generation understands uh, we cannot assume the absolute worst uh, and another person because they're a Republican or a Democrat. Uh, we have to work uh, together um, and succeed uh, together. And so I, I think emphasizing those types of things um, to students uh, and encouraging them, uh, starting from a young age, um, read newspapers, go watch your local te television uh, news network, uh, start getting those objective uh, news sources ingrained in your mind and making that a habit uh, to check the news uh, regularly and become, becoming informed, attentive uh, citizens over time. Um, and then also reaching out to their local elected officials, the city council people, uh, the state uh, legislators. Um, I was out Lawton High School just last week and gave out uh, some of my cards. And so I told them that anything that I can do to help personally, uh, let me know. And so it's a two-way relationship for sure. We have to get out the information, uh, be accessible, but other folks have to reach out to us and uh, tell us what, what it is that we can do uh, for them. So I think if we continue that approach, uh, I think we'll have uh, tremendous success uh, in the future. I'm really excited to see where uh, Generation generation Citizen go, because it's only been three years since it started in Oklahoma. So it's flown by and like you guys said, it's grown tremendously. So I'm excited. Yeah, thank you very much. Amy, I'll um, let you have kind of the last word here. And my question is a little bit different for you. I know that you are super plugged into civics and, and political life in Oklahoma and are passionate about Generation Citizen. In your time with the organization, what has been the thing that's been most impactful to you? Whether it's a specific example or an overarching theme, what is it that like you can feel fuel the fire in you for this cause? I think it's the, um, it's the teachers when they say things to the effect of, and when right now we're, we're in the middle of civics week um, where we're doing some different things for virtual student um, 
presenting their projects. So we're doing that in different ways online. And, and we're also honoring um, Miss Deborah Davis, who is at uh, Northwest Class in High School, uh, is a fabulous educator, government teacher, has worked in the district for over 20 years. Um, and, you know, when she says to me, I've I'm now able to teach the way I've always wanted to teach. And I think by that, she means that like mutual learning, our teachers don't necessarily know, nor would they have any reason to know how to connect with the city council person. And many of our teachers work in districts that they don't live in. So it's like, there's just a whole, a lot of reasons, but when there's that mutual learning between educator and teacher and student in the classroom, and they recognize they can work together to change um, the future of their community and and start to understand each other's worldview in a in a way that that allows for the empathy that that representative pay was talking about you know teachers see the pain of their students at all different levels and and what generation citizen offers is a way to address those real life issues in a productive collaborative and and way of learning you know mutual learning experience and so that's i think what has allowed um that has been what has been most impactful i think into the future and to get to the the dream that that representative pay and i share to have this across the state you know a deep deep investment in education public education in oklahoma is just going to be necessary um because some of those lists that we're on the top of um are, are directly impact um our schools yeah Excellent. I I will add on because we've got two minutes left, but that's exactly right. Talking about the mutual learning hits me hard too, because I remember being at the Capitol during the teacher walkout and seeing, you know, tens of thousands of teachers, many of them with their like yellow legal pad, jotting down notes and drawing diagrams and having to do action civics on the fly, right? Like they are outside the building preparing to go inside the building to have conversations about things that matter. And while the, you know, the big focus was on education funding, there was a lot of components to go into that. And so to see them learn that you could see the, the same fire be ignited in them. And when you've got, I think anytime when you've got teachers and students that are coming together uh, with a common goal and a common cause, um, that is a recipe for success, right? Like that, a rising tide lifts all ships. Um, and as it pertains more directly to the First Amendment and, and, and issues there, I, I had a conversation yesterday with uh, a national group that cares about democracy and governance and making change. And they acknowledge that they often forget that there's a very important role of the First Amendment in that, that the right to petition our government, the right um, the, to have the freedom of speech, uh, and those things are a big deal. Representative Pay mentioned, you know, subscribing to local newspapers and and watching your local, you know, TV news stations. That freedom of the press is vitally important to close the loop in all of this. Um, we'll see, in, you know, in about ten or fifteen minutes when the state releases their daily COVID nineteen numbers. Um, most of us get that information from the press, not necessarily from the State Department of Health. I mean, same numbers come out either way, but just the channels in which we get the information might vary. And all of that, I think, comes back to those lessons, those skills we learn at an early age, um, perhaps through a class or an organization like Generation Citizen. Well, and I will say, like, with the First Amendment, everyone has to continue to put pressure on preserving that those right, those liberties and that those rights. And I think so often our students, particularly students under 18, when they're not able to vote, are overlooked in that, that they don't share those same liberties. And and there was recently even some some conversations um, with the State uh, Board of Education and um, the, you know, around basic liberties, you know, not and not being protected classes for students. And those are really critical issues and things that are happening right now. And so I guess I would encourage students if they feel like maybe they're not being heard or maybe um, they are not being extended those full um, rights, that that's the time to go talk to your principal, talk to your state representative, talk to your teachers, because it's, it's possible, it's highly possible. And, you know, no one's going to go 
fight for, well, that shouldn't say nobody. <laughs> Not everyone's going to go fight for other people's rights. You have to speak up for yourselves. And, and that population of our students is something that's just really critical to me and, and what drives the work that I do, because we have to take their perspectives into consideration as we're laying out policy that's going to affect our state for generations to come. That's right. I'm going to uh, put the website on the screen there, right there. Uh, folks, they, if you're watching, please go to generationcitizen.org to find out more information. Um, that's a great resource. Amy, Representative Pay, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Andy. All right, well, we are going to take a about a 10 minute break again. We'll be back at the top of the hour with our third and final panel today. It's gonna to be about voting rights, uh, which is certainly very important. So we're going to run the banner and play the video and we'll see you back in about 10 minutes. Oh, 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 
back welcome back to the 2020 first amendment congress i'm andy moore i'm the executive director of freedom of information oklahoma we're so glad you're here 
This is our final session of today, and it addresses the theme of flexing your rights in a different way, your voting rights. So I know the election's over, but man, what a doozy. And this one has brought up a whole host of issues that many Americans did not fully appreciate or anticipate. And, uh, you know, one cool thing about our democracy is that as soon as one election is over, preparation and, and efforts towards the next one are already beginning. Uh, and to prove that point, here in Oklahoma City, this week is candidate filing for Oklahoma City City Council, I think some school board seats, and a state Senate seat that was recently left open by the election of Congresswoman-elect Stephanie Bice. So the democracy train keeps on rolling. And those are just the ones I'm aware of. I know, I'm sure there's a bunch more throughout the state. So for this, our final session of the day, we are going to discuss the importance of voting, the mechanics of casting a ballot by mail or in person, making a plan to vote, and becoming an engaged voter in all the ways. To guide our discussion, I'm going to turn it over to FOI Oklahoma board member, Laura Akers, um, and she is actually the chair of the committee that organized this whole event today. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Andy. It is wonderful to be here, and I'm excited to speak with the three individuals I'm about to introduce. They are truly experts and have the knowledge around elections and voting, as well as being an engaged citizen in the state of Oklahoma. So first, today we've got Brian Dean. He's from the ACLU of Oklahoma's Voter Protection Program. Also, Brian served for many years uh, with the Oklahoma State Election Board, so he has much information and knowledge coming from working in state government around elections. Next, we have Roxanne Logan, who is the Southeastern Oklahoma field organizer for Together Oklahoma. She's based in Ardmore, and she also is involved with the League of Women Voters. And then last, we have Angela Munson, who is the Outreach and Legislative Director for Oklahoma Policy Institute. But it is important to know that uh, Angela Munson is also the former State Senator Munson and has served uh, in our state legislature and has had many roles uh, being involved in the state of Oklahoma. So with that, we'll go ahead and just get started. And with talking about elections and voting, I thought it might be a good idea to kind of start at the beginning. We have many individuals in the audience today that are first time voters in 2020, or perhaps will be first time voters in 2021 or 2022. So who can vote in the United States? Uh, we know that when George Washington was elected America's first president, president, only 6% of the country was allowed to vote. So we have made significant strides since then as far as who can vote in the United States. But Brian, perhaps let's hear from you and introduce to us, you know, how old you have to be? Are you, Amer do you have to be an American citizen? I mean, what are really the, the key things to keep in mind for who can vote in the United States? Right, well, you, you have to be 18 years old and uh, you have to be a U.S. citizen. And um, we also have a rules uh, around, some rules around, um, for example, if you are convicted of a felony, um, you have to have served out the time of your original sentence before you can re-register and to vote. Um, if you've been adjudged um, incapacitated uh, mentally by a, by a court, um, you're also not eligible. So, yeah, we have a few rules there, and, and there, there are some others about about uh, you know when when maybe that franchise gets taken away. Okay. All right. So, um, so what does it take to register to vote? How can someone actually say I'm going to vote in the next election? But how do I do that? How do I even step up and make sure that I am ready to vote on election day? Uh, Roxanne, do you want to kick that one off for us? Uh, yes, you can, uh, to register to vote, you can always go to your county election board and register there. Uh, as of today, the Oklahoma State Election Board does not have where you can automatically register online. Uh, they do have a window where you can register, complete the application, but then you have to print it out, sign it, and mail it back in. And most any time, I know 
specifically here in Ardmore, we are constantly having voter registration events. Um, and a lot of times I will try to get to the schools and go to the senior classes and register students there because any student that's 17 and a half that will turn 18 before the election day can register to vote. So um, most every senior is eligible to register to vote. That's a really important point and something I, if I've heard that before, it just kind of went in the back of my mind. Um, but that is really important because yeah, say I am turning 18 next week and I wanna make sure I'm eligible to vote in that January election, the ones that uh, that our um, ED Andy Moore was talking about. So. You don't have to wait until you actually turn 18. You can go ahead and do paperwork and get started. So in Oklahoma, can you register to vote on the day of the election? Is that a possibility? Uh, you know, sometimes when you're watching national news, you might hear references to other states and how they do it. I'm seeing shaking of heads. Angela, you want to touch on this one? Yeah, thank you. And I'm glad to be here today. No, you cannot. Unfortunately, Oklahoma is not a same day registration state. And I just wanted to add to Roxanne's comments too. You can register at a tag agency. So young people who are like my kid who didn't get her driver's license till she was almost 18, you can do two things at once. Uh, state agencies like DHS county offices and some county health departments also offer opportunities to register. So many of the public agencies will have registration forms and information there routinely. No, this is not a same day registration state. Maybe one of these days, there are a lot of logistical kinds of things. Some states are mm -hmm. uh, around in the US and in many other countries, uh, same day registration in some countries, registration is re even required to get a driver's license or to even buy a house, believe it mm -hmm. or not. So why vote? Uh, for each of us, we might have a an different answer for that, something that really speaks to uh, maybe what we're involved in or what issues were important to us. But let's start with you, Brian. Why, why do you vote? What's a reason that brings you to the polls every time? Oh, I think we are having some technical difficulties. With Sorry. Sorry, I got you there. Okay. So one of the one of the things I've I've always said to people when they ask about about this is that um, voting is the only thing that's asked of us as citizens. Um, and when you talk about patriotism, and there's a lot of talk about patriotism and displays of patriotism, if you want to show me you're a patriot, vote. Vote in every election. Vote in local elections. Vote in school board races. That is how you show as an American that you are a good citizen. It's not just about waving a flag or singing an anthem or, you know, standing and covering your heart or, or what, what have you. Voting is really the only thing that our country asks of us um, to, to, to be citizens. And so for me, it's just a it's it's above all, it's our duty as citizens to vote. Um, and, and there's obviously a multitude of other reasons, and I'll, I'll let um, some of the other panelists speak speak to that if they wish. But but to me, it's just it's just that that obligation we have um, to show that we care about being an American. Wonderful, Roxanne. How about you? What causes you to vote each time? Well, I am a Cherokee Indian, and even though the Native Americans were here and owned this country and still own this country, they were not even recognized as citizens until 1924. And in most states, they were not even given the right to vote until 1957. And so I, I vote for all of those who were not allowed to vote, who were not even recognized as citizens. And I think it's my personal responsibility to vote. I think it's everyone's personal responsibility to vote. And I like being able to hold the people that I help elect accountable. Uh, when they're out campaigning for the office, whatever it might be, they're making all these promises. So after they're elected, I like to be able to make sure they stand up to everything they promised us they were going to do. 
All right. And Angela, what about you? Well, I vote because this form of government we have in this country called representative, uh, representative democracy is totally dependent upon citizens' participation in the process. And that participation fundamentally is through voting, number one step, number one step. There are a lot of other steps to participate, but voting is certainly fundamental to that process. You know, we send people to the state capitol, we send people to school board, city council, to Congress, we vote for a president. We have all these opportunities to elect people to speak for us. So when people who are elected to office, uh, we want them to voice what we feel, what we think, what we believe to be true and what we think to be beneficial to all of the people in our families, communities, whatever. And the only way we can do that is to, 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 co to collectively act. And, it, you know, one vote does matter. One vote sometimes uh, determines the outcome of a race. But all these votes collectively choose who's going to speak for us. And I want the person speaking for me to really voice my beliefs and my thoughts. We don't always agree, so I don't expect them to do that 100% of the time. And as a former elected official, uh, I know how hard that is. You represent, you know, some 70, 80,000 people. They don't always agree. So we as elected representatives have a responsibility to hear and to listen. And I want, as a voter, whomever is elected to represent me, to listen. I'm gonna tell a funny quick story. When I was first elected to office, uh, I used to keep uh, the hard copies of the poll books where people sign in and uh, shows that they're voting. Now, this was way before we can talk about mail-in mail ballots and some early voting mm -hmm. opportunities, but it was before then. So I'd keep this in my desk drawer. Whenever a constituent would call, I, you know, it's pretty anal like this. I'd pull it out and see if they voted in the mm -hmm. last election. Not that I wouldn't provide the same good constituency services, but it's important to know. And you just never know who might be checking. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I'm hearing some wonderful answers for why all three of you choose to vote. Uh, but something that I heard was from Roxanne, the accountability factor, and then also from Angela, kind of holding public officials responsible that they are to be your voice in that office. So it, it's important to vote, but it's just as important to be ready to cast that ballot. And what I mean there is having done your research, uh, walking in on uh, to the ballot box, knowing what's going, what questions are before you and about the issues as well as the candidates. So for the three of you, I'd like to hear maybe from your perspective, what are ways that a voter can educate themselves on the issues and the candidates before they walk into that? ballot box or fill out their ballot to mail in. Uh, Brian, let's start with you. Well, I think step one would be to try to get a sample ballot. And um, thankfully, it's it's a lot easier to do that now than it used to be. Um, used to, you'd have to hope maybe your local paper was going to print it in the newspaper. You'd have to go down and, and get a copy of the sample ballot at your county election board. Um, you could still do that. But um, thanks to the internet, um, uh, the, the, the uh, state election board now offers a portal on its website um, for voters where you can enter your name and your date of birth and it will pull up your registration and you can click just click a button and pull up a PDF of your sample ballot and that will show you everyone on your ballot. It'll show you every race, show you every initiative, it'll show you the exact language that's that's on any propositions that are on there, which I think often get overlooked, especially the local propositions. I think that's something that people often don't think about, but that's going to you know, determine school funding. It's going to determine uh, various tax proposals and things of that nature for uh, local and state government. Um, and and I think that's really just step one. And then step two is to seek out um, other sources. And um, there have been some efforts. Used to be that newspapers, and I was a newspaper reporter for a long time. Um, it used to be that newspapers would do voter guides and things like that. They don't have the money and the space to do that anymore because of what's happened with the industry. So there have been some efforts by other groups, including the League of Women Voters, um, uh, to try to put together some, uh, some voter guides. So it's always a good idea to seek those out as well. Wonderful. And we'll go with Roxanne next because she's very involved in the League of Women Voters and the what you referenced, Brian, the, the voter guide. Uh, I can speak 
from uh, an Oklahoma citizen who's viewed the last two ones that the League of Women Voters and other groups have worked towards publishing, and they're very informative, um, nonpartisan mm -hmm. information. So let's hear from you, Roxanne. Perhaps you could touch on that and also explain from your point of view, what are some ways to educate yourself before casting that ballot? Well, like you mentioned, the voter's guide that the League of Women Voters puts out, they do a lot of background research on everything that's going to be on the ballot. They do a lot of the research for you. So um, about the candidates, about their voting records, if there's any questions on there, uh, if there's any judges on there, which a lot of time the judges are hard to find information on. Um, but if there's, there's Google, there's speaking to people that you know are knowledgeable and that you respect them and you know that they uh, are going to be able to share information with you that's gonna help you understand. Uh, a lot of the questions, the way they're written, it's like they purposely make them where you can't really understand what they're trying to get across. Uh, so it is incumbent upon you to do a lot of your own research, sadly. Um, every time a candidate comes within driving distance that you feel comfortable with. If you want to understand what they're saying, go to their town halls, go to any public meeting that they are putting on, ask them questions. Um, that's what they're there for. They want to hear from you. Um, and that's, that's pretty much, pretty much it. I mean, there's a lot of different avenues for you to gain information. Um, so it's it's pretty open. All right, Angela, do you have anything to add? Any tips? Yeah, I think all those tips are great and right on point. To getting that sample ballot is really, really important. It is much easier than it used to be. Um, there's also some, some national sources. Uh, Ballotpedia is a source that you can look up issues and candidates. And, and I think those who are listening and watching ought, ought to uh, realize that maybe the search or the information search is a bit different from a candidate. If you're voting on a candidate or voting on an issue uh, and sources may be a bit different. Roxanne hit it. You know, if you feel comfortable now, COVID days, it's hard to go see a candidate, but everybody's got a website. Mm -hmm. Pull up that website, look at that information, compare, compare if it's an incumbent, there's going to be a voting record. So if you're interested in how this person voted in the past, you know, just Google Oklahoma State Senate or Oklahoma City Council and uh, look at uh, the ordinances or the statutes or the bills that uh, members had to vote on. See how that person voted. So past history is really, really important. They always talk about an incumbent record, having a record. Uh, Google the person. If nothing else, just Google a person and see what pops up. You'd be surprised what information you get. But let me quickly say, particularly to young persons, consider the source of the information. The league does a great job putting great, objective, unbiased information out. But when you look at uh, Instagram or, or even Facebook or some of the other social media sources I'm not even familiar with, uh, really think about the source of the information that you're reading or that you're looking at. Because sometimes it's not factual. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes we know about the bots and all the stuff that's happening out there in the world. Uh, sometimes the information you get may not even be from a source in the whole United States. Mm -hmm. So uh, be aware, young people, uh, before you decide that what you read or what you see is true. Use legitimate sources. League of Women Voters is good. Candidates' websites, state government city council, local school board sites that give you information about candidates uh, and about uh, initiatives. I wanted to quickly say those state questions are supposed to be written at sixth grade reading level. Uh, <laughs> and Roxanne is absolutely correct. Sometimes it could be rather confusing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can I just piggyback on, on what Senator Monson just said, which is that I wanna just put an emphasis on the importance of, of considering the source. There's a term for that that we call, and I, I know this is a, as a former newspaper journalist and someone who majored in journalism, media literacy is the term. And we could do an entire conference on media literacy. It has become a crucial issue 
because of the, the, the spread of social media and, and of, of just internet sources. And we've seen this with, with political uh, news. It has become an absolute cesspool mm-hmm. online of propaganda efforts and things like that. So you've got to be able to determine what makes a good source, what makes an independent source. Like when we talk about the League of Women Voters, they don't take sides. If you're going to some site that is, you know, specifically tailored to present news to conservatives or liberals, it's not going to have that same flavor. It's going to give you a slightly twisted version of of the facts. And so it's just crucially important, um, especially for young people. And I do think young people are savvy about this. And sometimes it's some of us older folks who who uh, don't do as good a job at, at considering sources and recognizing good sources. But that is so, so important. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Great point. So let's talk about actual voting. 2020 has been an interesting election year because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so uh, prior to the presidential election, we heard a lot of uh, candidates as well as uh, groups across the country talking about making a plan to vote, that this was really the election year to plan out how you were going to vote. And what they were referring to was maybe you vote in person on the day of the election. Maybe you vote early at your county election office, or maybe you vote by mail. Um, So what are we talking about when we, you know, what are the different opportunities for Oklahomans to vote? You know, we know about the in-person voting, but what are some of the other options? Brian, you want to lead us with that one? Yeah, and it's it's uh, uh, it's. I'm glad you mentioned that. One of the things I did, one of the things I did is kind of a my last year at the state election board was um, try to launch an online uh, page where people could make a plan to vote, um, because the studies have shown that if you do that, um, you are much more likely to vote. Um, and so that's one of the things I tried to do. Um, and, and you know, I wasn't able to do everything I wanted to do with it, but. Um, that that starts with again what we said about going and getting that sample ballot um and you know looking up your polling location if you're going to vote in person all those sorts of things um, but again you have options and so the, the first one obviously as we mentioned is voting in person on election day at your polling location um another option is to vote early um and that is done in oklahoma the thursday friday and saturday before the election uh, thursday and friday i believe it's um Oh, I'm gonna six. 9 a.m. 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then mm-hmm. on Saturday, it's, uh, I think, 10 to 2. Um, yeah. uh, and that's for statewide elections. It's it, uh, For non-statewide elections, it's only on the Thursday and Friday. But for statewide elections, um, including federal elections, it'd be for, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Um, and you can do that at your, your uh, county election board. Um, or you can do it um, for larger elections. Um, the larger counties are allowed to have uh, secondary voting sites. And they have done that, for example, like for presidential elections and and for uh, gubernatorial elections, um, they generally have a second site. And you can always go to the state election board's website um, and they'll tell you where those sites are going to be. Um, it'll also give you a map to your polling place. That same tool you can use to look up your sample ballot will give you a map to your polling place um, and just confirm what 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 you know precincts you're registered in um so it's just crucially important again before you you go vote you just check that that voter portal just to make sure a am i registered you know mm-hmm. hopefully i did it didn't get expired or something and then b getting that sample ballot and then c you know being able to know where you're go- going to go and vote so talk to me about the difference between absentee voting and voting by mail. Those were terms we heard a lot with this past election season. Who can touch on the differences there? Brian, perhaps you again. Yeah, I forgot I forgot to mention the third option, which yeah. is voting by mail. <laughs> and that's another thing. When I when the first one of the first things I did when I got to the election board was was launch an entire page and a media campaign to encourage vote by mail. And the what the, the, the slogan I came up with that with for that was skip the line, vote by mail. I voted absentee, I voted by mail. Um, and, and, and in the election board, when they talk about um, uh, absentee, there's absentee in person, which is the early voting, and then there's absentee mail, which is voting by mail. Uh, voting by mail is so easy. You you can go on to the uh, state election board's website, and you can register online to vote by mail. You can uh, choose to have all of your ballots for an entire year sent to your home. 
And the great thing about that is and then you never forget about a, a, an election because the ballot shows up in your mailbox. One of the things I think people struggle with sometimes in, uh, in you know, some of those more local elections, turnout tends to be really low. And one of the barriers there is that people just don't know there's an election sometimes. And so mm -hmm. the, one of the great things about voting by mail is ballot shows up and you have about, a, it's going to show up usually about a month before the election. So you've got plenty of time to research the candidates. Um, and then you, you have a couple of options now. Normally, uh, uh, for most voters, you have to get your ballot notarized. You you put it in an envelope and then you have a notary public um, notarize that. You can do that at most banks and places like that. Um, because of COVID, there's been an, an alternate way of doing that this year, which is to uh, send a photocopy of your ID back. Um, but then um, for disabled voters, if you are physically incapacitated, um, they're actually allowed to have two witnesses sign their ballot. Um, it's very important you do that because they can't count it unless you follow those procedures. But um, but absentee mail voting, I'm a big fan of it. Most of the election board personnel voted by mail because we were working on election day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, polls open, polls close. It wasn't real easy for us to get away. Um, so most of us do it. it. It will get counted. A lot of people are worried. Well, will my, my, my mail ballot get counted? They all get counted. There's not, you know, there's rumors about, oh, well, they only count if it's close. That's not true. All voted mail-in ballots are counted. Um, so uh, it's just a great way to vote. And I, I totally encourage people to, to check into that. And, and if I can, if I can add, Laura, because um, I always request an absentee ballot. Uh, so don't get confused. Brian was absolutely right. Absentee balloting and voting by mail in Oklahoma are pretty much synonymous. But just perhaps you get your ballot and you forget that you to fill it out, or you're nervous that the mail. Uh, may not get it there on time, or you can't drop it off at the county election board, which is a great option. That I dropped mine off this year on my way out of town. Uh, so if if that were to happen, young voters, and you thought, oh, it's election day, and I forgot to turn my ballot, you can still go show up. You'll have to do a little extra work, but you can still vote. So don't do don't lose your right. You know, don't. Don't forget, don't say I can't. No excuses allowed nowadays. Uh, make sure you do go and show up. Um, and there's so many. I hope we can get to some questions about the potential of losing one's right to vote. When, when I listened to Brian when he described the days that we can go vote, uh, I had the good fortune, my first, I spent a couple of years in the House of Representatives before I moved to the Senate. And uh, then former Senator Vicki Miles LaGrange, who became a federal judge, was my senator. We co-authored actually the first um, early voting bill. And that first bill had a whole lot more days on it than we have right now. So what we started with some almost, I hate to say, uh, 30 years ago, you know, 1990 or so, uh, 1991, that allowed more than just these three days or so, which allowed five or six days and should have been more, uh, has shrunk over years. So we don't want to lose uh, any more days. We don't want to lose or make uh, or create impediments or allow elected officials to create impediments to our right to vote. Yeah, I, I really like what Angela just added to the conversation, because if you do pay attention to national news stories, you may have heard at the end of September or in October that some states had started voting for the presidential election. And what she's referring to is those states have early voting that begins weeks and maybe even months prior to the actual election day. Um, and I know our neighbor Kansas uh, definitely starts early voting before we do, because I've previously lived in the panhandle where I had friends in Liberal and Guyman. And so we were voting. Uh, the, our Kansas folks got to vote like a whole week early compared to us in the panhandle. Um, but yeah, let's move on to uh, perhaps just some things to keep in mind about voting. Uh, straight party voting or straight ticket voting, that might be something if you haven't viewed your sample ballot before and you go in, that's that, that might be the first question that might throw you for a loop. So Roxanne, what can you tell us about that? Well, personally, I do not like straight ticket voting. Uh, to me, it creates uninformed voters. Uh, it's too easy to just go in and Mark the box at the top of your ballot, either Democrat or Republican, 
and really ignore everything that's on the ballot. And when you do that, if there are state questions on there, you don't get to vote for them unless you specifically go down and mark them. If there's judges on there, because judges are only retain or don't retain, you don't get to vote on them. And then something that a lot of people don't know is even if you go in and you mark the party box at the top, say you want to vote Republican, but then there is a Democrat candidate that you really, really like. You can go down and mark just that one candidate and the vote for that single Democrat will count for them and all the rest of your votes will be Republican candidates. Good. That's some good information for people to have. Um, this is something that's kind of been popular in more, more recent years, and we'll have Brian touch on this, but some people like to take selfies with their ballots. They really like to push or, you know, share with their family and friends, I did it, I voted. And some people do that with their election sticker, but other people may like to do it with their ballots. So can you take a selfie at the election booth with your ballot? Brian, is that something that we can do in Oklahoma? Yes, you can. And let me tell you something. Um, it is it is uh, was a load off my shoulders when they allowed people to do that, because one of the things that we had to deal with um, when I was at state election board and I always had to talk to media about this and everything it, because people would take those ballot selfies. And uh, just a few years ago, our law was a little ambiguous on what was allowed because mm -hmm. it was written in the 1970s there, and there was there was nothing in there. There were specific um, there's a specific laws in there that that um, don't require people to take pictures of marked ballots, um, and 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 there's a line in there saying that you won't show your marked ballot to anyone, uh, and that could be interpreted to say don't take a picture with your with your ballot, um, and though, you know, I, nobody was necessarily going to prosecute people for that. We had to advise folks, you know, just take a pic picture of yourself, but don't show, you know, who you voted for. Well, thankfully, because that became such an issue year to year, the legislature did take that up. And after a couple of hiccups, um, it got passed and signed into law. So thankfully now we do not have to worry about ballot selfies anymore. It is legal to take a ballot selfie if you choose to do so. Make sure though, if you are going to take a picture of yourself at the, the polling location, you still need to be careful about taking a picture of others, particularly if you're going to Take a picture around ballots. You cannot show, take a picture of somebody else's marked ballot. So um, I would always recommend um, doing that, you know, discreetly in the voting booth if you have to. Um, but just be careful about that because there are still some rules about photography in a, in a polling location. So watch your background, you know, mm -hmm. look at the whole picture. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd like to talk about voter site. Uh, Angela, you want to touch on this first? I certainly do because this is a major issue for me. Um, Voter suppression is alive and well in this country. Uh, Roxanne talked about the unwillingness to give natives the right to vote, people who are indigenous to this country the right to vote. Same with women, same with African Americans. So uh, we have had to fight for decades and decades, generations and generations for this right. And some people still don't think every person is entitled to a vote. Uh, in 2002, so that's a long time ago, I was on a panel with an individual who at that time was lieutenant governor of the state of Nevada. And the panel was just like this about voting and voting rights. And he made the comment very earnestly, very seriously, that he thought we made it too easy for people to vote in this country. And in fact, he said, we should ask people questions like, who's your lieutenant governor? or who's your congressional district representative before we allow them to vote. And the panel was coming to a close and I quickly said, and I guess we should ask people how many bubbles there are in a bar, a bar of soap or how many grains of sand there are on a beach, which were real poll questions as a black folk before uh, we truly got the right to vote. 
So the desire to suppress certain groups of people uh, from voting or accessing uh, the ballot is real in this country. And it can be done by closing, uh, um, in some states, closing polling places in Oklahoma too. So you may have to drive a long way to get to a polling place or moving a polling place so it's not on a bus route. It could be things like reducing the days that we have to go early vote or our actually um, making it harder to register to vote. So there are lots and lots of little bitty things that happen, unfortunately, across the country. Many are much more blatant, like a county in Texas that's closed the single um, polling place, moved it outside of the county uh, about 20 to 25 miles away, uh, not on a bus route, and, uh, and it was an area that had primarily Latinx voters. So, uh, you know, just be aware, be aware. And the only way, the only way that we can avoid voter suppression, legalized, structured, systemic voter suppression is to vote, mm-hmm. is to go and vote and make sure that the people who we represent value this right and that we as citizens value this responsibility. Would anybody like to add anything on the topic of voter suppression? Yes, I I, I think it's important to note that voter suppression um, is some of those traditional ways are still around, but it's what's really disturbing is we've seen some new ways that they, they've tried to go and, and suppress the vote. And this is something I had to deal with um, at the election board um, quite a lot just in the last couple of elections, which is we have now foreign countries that are actually um, – going through social media, putting out misinformation, um, you know, trying to divide people, um, using bot accounts to um, post things that aren't true. And a lot of times this is aimed at making people stay home, I'm telling them, hey, there's no point in going to vote because the election's rigged. Mm-hmm. Um, or telling them, you know, that, uh, oh, well, the polls are open till six o'clock when they're open to seven. Um, all those sorts of things have become a much bigger issue now. And one of the things we had to do at the election board, I was, we were working with social media to try to identify the, the social media companies, Twitter and Facebook. They've been going through and trying to identify some of these bot accounts. They've, they've taken down um, accounts run by Russia, run by Iran, um, run by uh, North Korea in some cases. And so it has become, and there's also some folks that are not affiliated necessarily with a, a foreign intelligence intelligence agency who do the same thing. People have always done that kind of thing by phone. There used to be a lot of efforts to call voters, you know, and it would be just dirty tricks. And I know um, Senator Monson would certainly probably have stories about that kind of thing. Um, but people would call and tell people, don't make sure you vote on uh, Thursday. The wrong day. Make sure you vote next Tuesday when the election was that Tuesday. Um, that kind of thing still happens today. Um, but what the, the dangerous thing is how much that's moved online. And it's just another reason why people have to be so skeptical of what they see on social media and of what we mentioned earlier, which is considering the source and verifying. If you see, see something that doesn't look right, if you see something that seems like it may not be true, especially just double check it with a source that you know you can trust. That's right. I'm so glad Brian talked about the social media and the voter suppression uh, efforts to make you just simply think your vote doesn't count. It doesn't matter whether you go or not. Uh, dirty, dirty trick. Uh, and we see more of it. And, you know, if a person is not inclined to vote to start with and then they read, well, it doesn't matter. So that certainly is going to uh, keep the likelihood of them staying home is certainly enhanced. So I, I'm glad you mentioned the phone calls, the emails, the wrong dates. Uh, that's common. Uh, you know, it happened this election cycle across the U.S. Wrong dates given. It's happened here in Oklahoma. Uh, just Brian is right. Consider the source. Make sure that it's trusted. It's from a trusted place and, and not from some bot somewhere. Mm-hmm. Right. And just keep in mind, they wouldn't work so hard to get you to stay home, to get you to not vote if your vote really didn't matter. That's right. That's the thing. They're scared of your vote. People who are trying to suppress your vote know the power of the vote. And that's why they're trying to get you not to vote. That's a great point. Yes, absolutely. So what should you do if you see some of that activity happening in your community? Um, you know, who, who do you turn to to say, 
I just got this phone call and they said election day is December 5th for the presidential election. That can't be right. You know, what, <laughs> what should you do? What, I mean, where can you turn? Mm -hmm. Well, anytime that you receive what you feel may be misinformation, like Angela and Brian have both said, you need to verify it through a trusted source. Mm -hmm. uh, you can call the Oklahoma state election board. You can visit your county election board. Uh, but you, there's always a way to verify any misinformation. And, and if it sounds wrong, it probably is wrong. Uh, so we, you do just need to be able to go to a reliable source. It's also important, I think, uh, in cases of voter suppression to report that to someone. And um, that can be the state election board for one. Um, or your county election board, um, uh, so that they can get the word out about the correct information. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the things that the, when I was at state election board, we really wanted people to let us know when something like that was happening because we wanted them to be able to go to, to the media or put things out on social media to say, hey, some folks are getting calls about this. This is not true. Here's the actual correct information. Um, it can also be a good idea to report that to, to the a group like the ACLU. Uh, we have a voter hotline. Um, Every major election, they're going to have a voter hotline. You can call that, um, talk to somebody like me who has some expertise in that issue. And again, we'll be able to check into those things, make sure they're correct, but also try to get the word out because those private groups can also get the word out. Hey, this stuff's coming out. It's not true. Um, so we just want to make sure that people are getting the correct information. And the best way to do that, let people know who have an extra um, a microphone can get it out to, um, to, to, to folks so that they have the correct information. That's right. That's right. And there are a lot of 1-800 numbers on election day in particular. Make sure you're calling the right one. But ACLU is a good source. Um, there are um, some really good national voting. You think, oh, it's national. They won't reach Oklahoma. But they have contacts right back here in Oklahoma, probably ACLU. Uh, but uh, people will look into it. So don't just see it. If, Like they said at TSA a long time ago, if you see something, say something. Absolutely. That's a good way of summarizing it. So how often do we vote in Oklahoma? Andy mentioned before we picked this off that we uh, there's people this week filing for elective office in our uh, for local elections. But, um, you know, everybody kind of not in it all the time. But uh, Roxanne, uh, Brian, I think you both can probably share a little bit about really how often elections can be called in the state. Well, the county and city elections vary by county and city. Um, because in, in Ardmore, the city officials are elected every, they, they have four year terms. Uh, so the county election, they have four year terms. Now, the presidential election, of course, is every four years. Uh, the representatives, when your state representatives, have to be reelected every two years. So, but then they can only serve a total of 12 years. And the senators are the same way. Uh, the senators are elected every four years and they can only serve a total of 12 years. So yeah, like they said, it's constantly happening and it depends on where you live uh, we do have city election, city commission elections coming up here soon, uh, this next year. So yeah, it's, it's just, but like we talked about earlier, if you register for your absentee ballot, you won't miss any elections. Mm -hmm. Register for it and they will automatically send you your absentee ballot. In Oklahoma, you do have to request it every year. In some states, you do not. Uh, you will just automatically get an absentee ballot. But in Oklahoma, on January 1st or 2nd, just make it one of the things you have on your calendar to do. Go to the Oklahoma Election Board and automatically sign up for a year's worth of absentee ballots, and you mm -hmm. won't miss any elections. If people kind of keep in mind that local elections are usually springtime elections in Oklahoma, school board races, city council races, and you're right, filing underway in Oklahoma City right now for a school board. Uh, and they generally are every year. 
because terms are staggered among members. Every year, every other year, some members' terms expire this year, others will expire next year. So there's this kind of rolling off of members or rolling elections. Uh, of course, the governor can cause special elections. The state legislature can state set elections. Uh, Brian will appreciate this. You know, when elections are called, somebody has to pay for them too. So um, sometimes cities and counties and school boards are, are waiting to piggyback on another election so they don't have to pay for right. that full expense. But um, primary elections or primaries and runoffs and general elections, Virtually for any candidate that could happen if there's more than two candidates that filed for office. So we do have a lot of elections in Oklahoma, but that's okay because that's uh, all those are opportunities to exercise our rights as citizens. So uh, one of the things I had to do whenever I was at the election board was uh, update the list of local elections of, uh, that were coming up. And I think one of the things people have to keep in mind you know, most people think of elections, they think of the big elections, the presidential election, the gubernatorial election, which are every each every four years and they're staggered so that every other year we have a big statewide election. We have a presidential election this year in 2022. We'll elect a governor and we'll elect most of our state officers, um, various members of Congress. Um, but in those off years, those so-called off years, we actually have more elections. Um, in the off years, because of the way the calendar works, you can have those local elections um, every month. You can have an election, except for in December. The law says that um, only Oklahoma City or Tulsa can call a special election in December. Um, but any other local locality in any other county, you can have an election 11 months of the year. In Oklahoma or Tulsa, you, Oklahoma City or Tulsa, you can have an election all 12 months. There could be an election. Now, in practice, obviously not everyone's going to have an election every month. But somewhere in Oklahoma, someone's voting almost every month in an off year. Mm -hmm. And um, even in those, and in those on years, again, you're going to have, it's not just that general election. You've got a primary. You've got a runoff. Presidential elections, the presidential primary is a different month than the statewide primary. So you're voting for the presidential primary, and then a month or two later, you're voting for your uh, any state officials who were on that ballot that year. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have special elections, and um, you know you mentioned uh, Senator Bice, who is now uh, who's who's going now going to be the, the 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 U.S. House representative, and they're filling her seat. That election is going to be in, you know in a quote unquote off year. So there are always those unexpired terms that are coming up. Mm -hmm. um, and there are just local questions. If a, if a school wants to uh, pass a bond issue, you know, they need to get some funding to build a new, you know, um, gymnasium. Well, they're going to do that. And it's not going to be necessarily on a presidential election ballot. That's mm -hmm. probably going to be um, mm -hmm. here in one of these, these off years. And that's, again, why I think it's a really good idea to sign up for um, uh, mm -hmm. voting by mail. I also did want to mention, because uh, Senator Monson brought this up, the, the cost issue, because um, I want to give a shout out to our state election board and our state election officials and our county election officials, all the way down to our poll workers in this state. We do a really good job here. We avoid a lot of the pitfalls of other states that that do things like she mentioned, where they close a polling place in one county or close early voting in one county. In Oklahoma, everything is the same in every county. Um, we're actually the largest state um, in the nation where our voter system is the same. Everyone's got the same ballots, the same voting machines, um, and we do a great job. We do a great, great job of, of, of doing things equitably as far as, you know, um, how everyone's got the same rules. But we do elections here cheaply, and because of that, we have limited days for early voting. That's the single biggest barrier right now um, for more early voting days is cost. The county election boards, in some of the smaller counties, they only have, you know, one and a half full-time employees. They have, you know, uh, the larger counties, I mean, they just struggle right now to do early voting as it is. Um, so to extend those days, they would need more staff to do that. Um, and that means more money. So, um, you know, it's really important when we talk about these things that we, it goes back to the legislature and that goes back to voting. So if you want more early voting days, you need to demand that of your candidates when they're running for office and hold them accountable. Because mm -hmm. as it stands, the, our election board personnel at both the state and the county level work very hard to put on really good quality, fair elections. And they do a great job of it. Um, 
and, and we get great accurate results. We get them quickly in this state. But the trade-off is we don't necessarily have some of that same access to uh, early voting days as they do in other country, in other in other um, states. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'll teach your horn for you, Brian, too. Oklahoma has been a model uh, nationally. You know, the work that I've done nationally, you know, we point to Oklahoma or others point to Oklahoma. So Oklahoma system of election and balloting as a model to have safe and secure and reasonably accessible um, elections. So um, my hat often, I've worked with many state election board secretaries and uh, our county election board secretary, the last two, they tend to get in those jobs and they're good jobs and they're committed servants and they stay. But I also wanna give a shout out to all those poll workers who work for peanuts, literally. And for those young people who are listening, check into being a poll worker, see what it takes, what kind of training, you know, are there things that you can do that would help take the burden off of uh, uh, people who work elections and they work very, very hard. Uh, there may be opportunities that people never knew about, uh, ways to exercise your rights as a citizen and to help enable other people to vote. Right, because right now most of the poll workers are, um, retired women who don't have a job, who have 14 hours to spend at the poll that day. And it's hard to come up with volunteers, especially during COVID. It was, it was a real job uh, to come up with enough people to work the polls this year. Uh, so yes, uh, like Angela said, think about volunteering. You do, get, you do get paid a little bit, little bit. but uh, I think actually if they could, if they would lower the age where people could, could uh, mm -hmm. work the polls, possibly give them extra credit at school, uh, it would help them actually learn the process, what it, what it takes, you know, from the time someone is handed a ballot to vote until they get it turned back in. You know, whether or not they can ask questions of the poll workers, uh, whether or not they have to mark every box, you know, just questions like that. But it will help prepare them to be educated voters when they get old enough to vote. The uh, average age of our poll workers in, in, in Oklahoma is over 70. Wow. Um, and uh, it's a looming crisis, actually, because we're not replacing them as quickly as they are. Um, you know, either retiring or, or frankly dying off. And um, the younger generations have just not stepped up to the same rate as, as uh, our, our parents and grandparents did. So um, it is, it is a looming issue where if we don't find a way to increase our poll workers, we're going to have to look at some changes to our system. Um, and all you've got to do to be a, to, to be a poll worker is be a registered voter. And you can volunteer and they will, the, the, the county election board will put you through training and um, they'll assign you to elections. And it's a great way to see the process. It's a great way to feel like you're making a difference. Um, and it's, it's, it's so crucial. And the, the, the counties, the, the work they do getting enough poll workers is just amazing, especially like, uh, like Roxanne mentioned during, during COVID, it's been a, a real challenge and they've done a great job, but it is, sometimes it feels like it's smoke and mirrors trying to get this stuff done. Um, with what we have. And so it's crucially important we have more young people um, get out and, and volunteer to be poll workers. Right. Well, thank you, all three of you. We have had a wonderful discussion today, and I appreciate all three of your expertise and knowledge around this issue. Uh, we are pretty much out of time at this point, but I, I'm going to throw one last question out there, and I'd like uh, for Angela to answer this question. And we've touched on it a bit already, but does my vote really count? Angela was the one who said earlier today that sometimes elections are decided by as little as a vote or a dozen votes. Um, and that is, we have evidence of that in Oklahoma over the last few years. So Angela, I'd like you to kind of have the last words with does my vote really count? Yeah, I just don't want anybody to leave this discussion believing that their vote doesn't count or their vote doesn't matter because it really does. And here in Oklahoma, historically, you can go check uh, elections that have been decided by a single vote. I, I remember my first election, I lost. Uh, and, and I'm just going to say, honestly, I lost two times before I won a race into the state house. But the first election was decided by 132 people. 
that's not a lot of folk. You know, that's people on a couple of blocks. So votes really do matter. Um, but you know what? Even if an election is run by 12,000 and you say, oh, if I stayed home, it didn't matter. But your vote lit, was a part of that process that lent it to that 12,000 difference. Um, so don't ever think uh, it's somebody else's responsibility or it doesn't matter. Uh, your vote counts. Every vote counts and every vote should be counted. And we're creating a system in this country to make sure that people have safe and accessible means to vote. And legislatures have to, you know, upfront that money. Brian was right. It requires, you know, more than $2 an hour. I don't know what that rate is, but we need to be able to uh, afford and attract people to work at polls. So we got to in make the investment. If we make the investment in turn, we'll get the participation that um, this state and this country really deserves. Right. Wonderful. Well, with that, we're going to send it back to Andy so that he can close out our First Amendment Congress for 2020, our first virtual uh, First Amendment Congress. So thank you all to our last panel speakers. We appreciate your expertise and knowledge in the issue. And on to you, Andy. Super. Thanks, Laura. All right. Well, that was terrific. And um, thank you all for being with us this whole day. This has been a fun experience in technology and uh, civic engagement and the First Amendment. Uh, but now, hopefully, the moment you've all been waiting for, it's time for us to announce the winners of the Zach Taylor First Amendment essay contest. If you're not familiar with who Zach Taylor was, uh, he was a staunch supporter of the First Amendment and citizen inclusion in the governing process. Uh, he served as the executive director of the Association of Central Oklahoma, ACOG, for nearly 30 years. ACOG is a government association that's composed of 35 cities, towns, and counties in the Oklahoma City metro area. Uh, Mr. Taylor's notable accomplishments at ACOG include the implementation of an enhanced 911 emergency phone system in 1989, and then later in 2005, an update to that system that enabled it to work with wireless phones, which is very important. Uh, Zach also led efforts with transportation planning, water planning, environmental issues. And he believed that everyone in central Oklahoma from small town citizens to urban pioneers should have the same voice on quality of life issues and any other issues that impact everyone equally. Mr. Taylor was a leader at FOI Oklahoma. He served as our organization's First Amendment Congress Planning Committee uh, for more than 10 years. Following his death in 2008, uh, we decided to rename this event or this essay contest in his honor. Uh, hence, it is the Zach Taylor First Amendment Essay Contest. The contest is open to all public, private, charter school, and homeschooled students, uh, high school students. Students were asked to pick one of their five freedoms that are enumerated in the First Amendment and write about its significance to them. So uh, I don't have a drum roll sound machine, but our first place winner, which receives a $300 Visa gift card was Quinby Rainey from Hammond High School, who wrote about the freedom of the press. A quote from Quinby's essay reads, the press is also responsible for monitoring the government's actions. When the press successfully works through mechanisms sprouting from the media, the nation will benefit. On the other hand, if America lacked a powerful independent press, there would be no authority to hold those in control of the government accountable for the responsibility to listen and alter laws in order to benefit the country's needs. Well done, Quinby. Second prize, which receives a $200 Visa gift card, is Jakira Downs, also from Hammond High School. And Jakira chose the freedom of religion, a quote from their essay, freedom of religion is essential in my life, being Native American. If my people and I didn't have the freedom to practice our ways of life, ceremonies, and traditions, we would be lost and we would be forced to live in the white man's world, even if that was not our beliefs. Our religion is one of the few things we have left. We are very proud of it. We keep it very sacred and hold it very close to our hearts. Well done. 
And then our third prize, which receives a $100 Visa gift card, is Jolie Walker, also from Hammond High School, where apparently they are educating civic thought leaders that our world so desperately needs. All three of our top prize winners were from Hammond High School. Uh, shout out to those teachers there um, who clearly teach them how to think and write, which is a, you know, knockout combo. Uh, Jolie chose the freedom of speech saying, not only is freedom of speech a privilege, but it is essential in our world today. Without freedom of speech, the entire foundation of America would be different. Without the freedom of speech, there would be no presidential election. You would not be able to voice your opinion on who you should or who you should not vote for. There would be no election for anything. People would simply acquire the position without having to earn it. This would then lead to a society that is more like a monarchy than a democracy. Uh, we also want to quickly name all the students who received honorable mentions, and they will all each receive an iTunes gift card. Uh, Naleli Panjoja from Dove Science Academy, Christopher Bailey from Augustine Christian Academy, Kimberly Botello from Dove Science Academy South, Kate Grable from Hammond High School, Tatum McIntosh, Hammond High School, Frida Medina, Dove Science Academy South, and Liliana Zavaleta from Dove Science Academy South. Congratulations to all of our winners. On behalf of FOI Oklahoma and Americans everywhere who care about the First Amendment, thank you to everyone who submitted an essay and spent time contemplating how vitally important the First Amendment is to our democracy. And that brings us officially to the end of our program today. Thank you to our presenting sponsor, the Inasmuch Foundation, to all of our guests, panelists, all the teachers, students who are out there trying to make the very best out of a very difficult situation. I hope you have a great afternoon, enjoy the nice weather today, and have some happy holidays. <laughs>